Ladies and gentlemen, episode number 148 is brought to you by Duke Cannon, which is one of my favorite brands. Fall is here. And if you are a beer lover, that means that likely your favorite event, which is Oktoberfest, is just around the corner. Problem being, you're probably not going to board a plane and head to Bavaria this year, which I've never been to, but I've heard it's unbelievable. But that gives you an opportunity to start a new beer tradition with Duke Cannon's October Fresh. You see what they did there? It's pretty sassy, actually. October Fresh is the beer fest located entirely in your personal shower. You can celebrate beer and also get incredibly squeaky clean with the huge 10-ounce big-ass bars of soap that come in the Duke Cannon beer and bourbon box. They are in actually infused with booze and with a touch of scent from cedarwood, sandalwood, citrus, and oak barrel. They will make you smell like an alpine forest, which is probably better than what you would smell like at the end of a night in a Bavarian beer garden. If foreign beers are not your thing, that is okay. Duke Cannon has what would be considered a decidedly domestic offering of the Bud Box, which is great American beard necessities, including beer balm to soften, beard oil to nourish, and beard wash to rinse and repeat. Duke Cannon's American-made products are as functional as they are fun. As I mentioned, the beer and bourbon box, which is $25, which is going to include four separate big-ass bricks of soap in a sturdy box. You're going to get one which is made with Old uh, Milwaukee, Deschutes Fresh Squeezed IPA, Big American Bourbon, and Great American Beer. I also mentioned the Bud Beard Box. That's a $45 box and includes three separate products for any bearded fellow who happens to appreciate beer. You're going to get the Great American Beard Balm, the Great American Beard Oil, and the Great American Beer Soap. So you have your choices. If you have the top game, the bottom game, and everything in between. I... Can't say enough good things about these big-ass bricks of soap. I have them in both of my showers, and, you know, there's two things I really like about them. One, they smell awesome, but two, they last an insane amount of time. If you want to check them out for yourself, which I recommend, and keep in mind that the holidays, also known as the shopping season, are right around the corner, you can visit DukeCannon.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT10, all one word, all uppercase. Cleared Hot 10 for 10% off your next order. Free shipping with orders over 20 bucks. DukeCannon.com. Promo code Cleared Hot 10. This episode is also brought to you by Helix Mattress. And I wish I had focused on my sleep earlier in life. I spent, man, decades, no bullshit, decades waking up feeling more tired than when I went to bed. There was probably a variety of issues going along with that, but one of them for sure was my mattress. And there's plenty of reasons that you're not going to be able to sleep. It might be, I don't know, you watched the recent presidential debate. You're worried perhaps about the pandemic, your love life, anything else, something occupational. I get it. There are plenty of reasons to toss and turn. Don't make a mattress that is uncomfortable or not suited for your body, another one of those reasons. Enter Helix Sleep. They have a quiz that takes just about two minutes to complete, and it's going to match your body type and sleep preference to the perfect mattress for you. Everybody is unique. Helix Mattresses knows that. So they have several different mattress models for you to choose from. Soft, medium, firm, mattresses that are great for cooling you down if you sleep hot, and even... A Helix Plus Matrix, Matrix, Mattress for plus size folks. I took the quiz myself when they reached out about sponsoring the podcast, and it matched me with their Twilight Lux Mattress. I needed something that was firm. I traditionally sleep on my side, 
And that's what it came back with. I was hesitant because I had never ordered a mattress online and I didn't understand how the quiz was necessarily going to help. I was curious as to how it was going to be delivered. And then it showed up in a box that looked far too small for a mattress to fit in. I cut the thing open. It was actually pretty cool to see it unravel itself and I don't want to say inflate, I guess it would be decompress. And a few hours later, boom, on top of that thing, one of the best night's sleep of my life. It was amazing. So if you are looking for a mattress, you can go and take the quiz. You can order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You do not ever need to go to a mattress store again. Helix is, like I have said, an awesome mattress, but you don't need to take my word for it. They were awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. Go to helixsleep.com slash cleared hot. Take the two-minute sleep quiz, and they will match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Ten-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. If you don't like it, they'll pick it up for you. But don't worry about it. You are going to like it. You actually might love it. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for the listeners to the podcast. HelixSleep.com slash cleared hot. Stop tossing and turning. Get a good night's sleep. Wake up feeling like a recharged battery instead of a drained one. And that's it on the business side of the house tonight. My guest today, whew, how do you describe this woman? She is a force to be reckoned with. And originally, somebody associated with her publishing house reached out to me. So obviously, she is an author. And she wrote a book called The World Looks Different Now. And we recorded this episode in September, which is Suicide Awareness Month. Unfortunately, suicide directly touched her family. Her son, her older son, committed suicide less than three months before he was due to deploy to Afghanistan. So not only a suicide, but an active duty military suicide. I of course, jumped at the opportunity to sit down and talk with her, but I had no idea how incredible her background was. The, the book itself, the story of her son, the aftermath of what happened is heartbreaking. That's the only way that I can describe it. But we opened by talking about her, talking about Margaret and who she was and where she came from in her life, and it was absolutely fascinating. So I'll give you the wave tops. She started off her... I was almost said life, but nobody started off their life as a journalist. She started off her professional career as a journalist and a television producer who reported on a variety of subjects from Middle East politics to the British royal family. She was a radio correspondent for ABC News. She was the first American broadcast journalist to report the end of the Falklands War in 1982. Several, several years later, she became the first radio correspondent to report on the AIDS epidemic in Africa. She came back to the United States in 1992 and taught journalism and television production at the University of Memphis. She worked on an HBO documentary. Uh, all this time, she was also writing. Um, unbelievable. An incredible amount of time spent outside of the United States traveling to war zones throughout the world. And her, like I said, her personal experience was unbelievable. I can't thank her enough for coming up and not only sharing her story, but the story of her family and the story of her oldest son. So I'm going to shut up and let her speak for herself. Episode number 148 with Margaret Thompson. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, one of them, give it to me, I need it. That way, because I'm not smart enough to sync up audio and video, but I'm smart enough to go onto YouTube or Google and find a program that does, but it needs wave spikes. So now everything is good to go. Okay. You look nervous. <laughs> you don't need to be nervous. Where did you start your travels from? You came in yesterday, right? We came in yesterday. Yes, from Nashville. I am going to guess that the skies were not covered in smoke in Nashville. No, they were pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually really bummed. Are you guys staying for a little bit after this? Yes, we're staying for a couple of days. 
in the worst time that you could because if you're up in Whitefish, to the north is the beautiful Big Mountain Resort. To the east of that, you could see into Glacier National Park. Notice I said you could, but you're not going to because the stuff is going to be here for a while. So you actually – you did not win the lottery on your no. your days to visit, but I appreciate you making the uh, the time to come out here. Oh yes, we were happy to do that. Yeah. So your publisher sent me a copy of your book, which I'm sure that we will get into. But I'm curious as to what led you to journalism. We're going to talk about you for a little bit. I was afraid you were going to do that. <laughs> It's important. Here's the one thing you learn about me. I don't care about me at all. So we're not going to talk about me at all. We're going to talk about you. But you, at the beginning of the book, you talk about living in Europe, specifically London, London as a journalist. I'm curious what, what led you down that path. Yes. I always wanted to cover foreign news. It was just, it seemed so challenging to me, especially because the networks back then, it was ABC, NBC, CBS, they didn't cover much foreign news. And I felt that there should be a lot more. I felt that yeah. Americans should know more about what was going on in other parts of the world. So that just was my dream. And that kind of became my thing. And I had I had been in Paris, I had gone to school there for a semester, just for a semester, but that made me feel like I owned all of Europe and that kind of thing. <laughs> and I had every right to go back there. So after I graduated from Columbia, Columbia University, I got a master's in journalism there. I went to I went to London, kind of on a flyer and with kind of some vague promises of work that happens a lot in journalism. Even back then, we're talking kind of old school journalism. You mean like, hey, come out here and we'll see how it goes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, or, that's tough to go across the pond on. Yes, it is. <laughs> but if you're very young, I was I was quite young. I was one of the youngest in my in my graduating class. You you're idealistic and you kind of yeah. want to do those things and. I wasn't afraid to do it, I guess. And You're at a time in your life where you can take some gambles. You can. You're young. You think you've got your health. You're not worried about a lot of things. So yeah. I went to London and I kind of pounded the pavement. There was the old uh, Fleet Street in those days. And that's where they had all the newspapers or a lot of the newspapers were headquartered. And some American papers and magazines also had their headquarters over there. So I had some work lined up called stringing, like writing articles and things like that, just, again, on a piecemeal basis. I did not come in as a tourist. <laughs> that can get you not deported. It's not the right word, but oh, kicked out. Oh, if you're on a tourist visa yes, and you're working. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I know of a few of Americans who've tried that, and it did not work out well for them. But maybe in those days, they would have been more lenient because this was, this was in the 80s. I don't know. But I had a letter. I had a letter from from an editor. And then once I hit the ground over there, I could find work with any American or foreign company, but not a British company. That, again, I think would have required maybe special permission or something. But anyway, I ended up working at ABC, ABC News in the London Bureau, which was kind of like my dream job. Yeah. But I had always been a print person. I say always. So I was still very young, but I had always worked in print, not in broadcasting. So that there and that was, was a kind lot of the of pressure. As, that was kind of the ascent of broadcasting late oh, 70s, yes. early 80s. Oh yes, definitely, especially like at ABC, it was um, a gentleman by the name of Rune Arledge was the he was one who started ABC's wild, Wide World of Sports. He uh, came up with this idea that of having three anchors in three different locations. Hmm. They they had they had an anchor man in London, Peter Jennings, who was well known as a as a foreign correspondent. Then they had Frank Reynolds in Washington and Max Robinson in Chicago, who was one of the first African American anchors. And so it was kind of a tri And would they anchor simultaneously? Or they would just yeah. have Oh, I was say technology wise, that was actually probably stretching it back in the day. That was totally cutting edge. That was way out there. It was like Rune Arledge again, Wide World of Sports. He uh, had he wanted to maximize the technology as much as possible. So he said, "We can do this." And they just kind of had throws to each other, and 
the our our links in London were pre recorded because it was too risky. Oh, the, or probably the time shift as well. Yes, it was partly that because there was what five hours five hours difference, and so we would we would finish up about ten o'clock at night, and then they would play in the links. But partly it was because too that something could go wrong. Uh, Never. Technically, not <laughs> no, on not, live TV. not with technology. And uh, in those days, we had just like a certain window window of satellite time. We didn't have dedicated tra- oh, it was transponders. Satellite. <laughs> it was satellite. It was satellite. <laughs> I, yes. In my head, as you're describing this, I'm thinking, we can do this on our cell phones now. Yes. We can walk around in our pocket with the technology to do a try broadcast live record. And yes. Oh, how things have changed. So where yes. were you originally from? For the good and for the bad and oh, the yeah. changes. I think more for the um, bad. To be clear, I think I've landed now that yeah. the connectivity and the amount of information is. I love it. But you have to be careful with it, and I think it mm-hmm. uh, it pulls people in so much that they lose a little bit of actual greater context and perspective. Their world gets narrower, mm-hmm. even though they have more access to information. It's yes. a scary time. Yes, I agree. So we didn't have all that back then, and you were asking uh, where where am I from? Yes, where did this all start? I I was born in Memphis and grew Tennessee up in Memphis. Girl your whole life, huh? Yes, well, so except much, for the London. I was there growing up. <laughs> Yeah, had a pretty pretty sheltered existence, I guess you could say. But I always wanted to be in newspapers, which is so strange. Like when I was seven years old, we I started a newspaper for my street or for the community. And so we're talking as long as you can really remember. Really young, yes, okay. as long as I could remember. I grabbed the first Nancy Drew book and that I ever saw, made me want to write, and I dictated stories to my mother because obviously I couldn't type when I was six or seven years old. So I would dictate them to her, and she could type but not well. So I don't know where that just that just comes from the very instinct I think of who you are, and my- it makes sense to me. I knew at about eleven years old, I would say, the path that I wanted to go down, and I have a hard time articulating to people why. Even now, I turn forty three next month, and I am actually not much better at describing the reasoning why. It was a gravitational pull, and I never looked in any other direction. So when you say that. It's like, okay, you're my kind of person. We're going to get through this just fine. And some people are like that. I think they know what they want to do from a very, very young age. Some, not all. I I look at my three kids and I'm, it doesn't worry me because they don't express those things. They have, they have some, uh, I would say conceptual directions that they're heading, but far less precise than how I felt. And it, I'm okay Mm -hmm. with that. It it takes all types. And I think they're all going to find their way for me. It was it was easier, but I tell you what, I didn't realize. I look back at my life now. I got very, mm-hmm. very lucky along the way by being so focused and targeted. I didn't have many Plan Bs. In full disclosure, I didn't have any Plan Bs, and I didn't realize the injury rate. I didn't know what I don't know what I would have done if things didn't go my way. So I got very fortunate going that path, and it's it's kind of something that I caution people on now. Is it's great to be that focused, but give me five percent of your upstairs horse powered for a slight plan B. Don't make the mistake that I did. It worked out for me, but a coin toss a few times along the way and it probably wouldn't have. Yes, I totally agree with that because I think I should have maybe looked at other paths, other avenues, other careers, possibly instead of kind of like wanting that certainty, just wanting that certainty so badly that this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, unless you just feel you're so talented and you're so driven in a certain direction. And, and I really wasn't, but I just, I just think I inherited a love of writing and literature really from my father. He was. Did he read to um, you? Where does it come from? He, he just was a very literate person, just read everything everything, read all kinds yeah. of philosophy. He loved William Faulkner. He had uh, he was a doctor. Also, my father was a doctor. My mother was a doctor, which was very unusual for, say, they got married in the 1950s. Uh, yeah, I can that. See that was really, really unusual to have a mother who was a doctor. It was really even unusual to have a mother who was a nurse. But, I mean, no, it was all right to be a nurse, but it was not all right to be a doctor. So, what type of medicine did they practice? She, my mother was a pediatrician, which was like the only okay thing she used to say yeah. for women to do. I mean, they could do a few other things like 
she had a friend who was a pathologist, that sort of thing. But it was really unusual. Like she and this other lady, they were the only two in their medical school class. Doesn't that sound insane talking about that in those terms in yeah, 2020? It does. It was. It's the yeah the opposite of the world that we're living in right now. It's and I'm actually glad that it is like that because to me it means we're making catastrophic leaps and bounds in the correct direction. Right, I agree. So she was like one of those early trailblazers, and my dad was a surgeon, and they met in medical school or just after medical school when they were doing residencies in Memphis, which is a big area for medical school education. There's a big medical school there and everything, and uh, my mother was from Middle Tennessee. My dad was from northern Mississippi. And, but his real love, he was just very brilliant. I guess medicine wasn't difficult for him, but his real love was this, was literature and, and thinking and philosophy and that sort of thing. So, um, Sounds like a Renaissance man of sorts. Yes. <laughs> and then I think I was more influenced by my, by my mother, though, um, because it was kind of that early, early day of women can have it all. You know, you can you can have the career and you can have the family. Nobody and, can tell you what to do anymore. Nobody's going to put a yeah. governor or boundary on you. And that is and it isn't true. You know, I found that I found that growing up. I, I know that she experienced some she experienced a lot of hardships. She did experience some discrimination. She felt in in her career and then ultimately they did divorce when i was about 21 and that's always hard on kids my brothers were younger i have two younger brothers and um so i think i saw things that made me think that it's not really that easy to have it all it's like you said about your own career you have to be you have to be very very lucky yeah. You have to marry the right person if you're going to get married who's very, very supportive and does not have issues of their own and that sort of thing. I think you said it. you have to marry the right person. And I think it's easy to look from the outside and say, well, I wish my life was as perfect as whoever. But you're not living in that house and you don't see things behind the curtain. I was uh, in... February of next year, I'll have been married for 20 years, but we're 18 months into a divorce right now. And I'm it's sorry. rough. It, yeah. it, I'm sorry, too. I, uh, I I feel bad not only for her, but for my kids and for myself and what we've had to go through. And one of the things that I struggle with is I don't want my children to have a skewed perspective of marriage. And I've had a conversation with them uh, multiple times or any time that they want to talk about it. And I'll tell them the relationship with your mother and I And the fact that it did not work out does not mean that relationships can't work out or that marriage doesn't work. What it means is that you need to find the right person. And also on the other side of that coin, if you are with somebody and they are not the right person, there's a path to correct for that as well. Neither of those are easy though. Right. And all three of them, and being at different ages, they're now 12, 15, and 16, all three of them have reacted very differently. They have their own filter that they view the world through and what has uh, and what is going on in the relationship but it is it is the exact opposite of easy for sure mm-hmm. yeah I think it's it's tough for kids and when I was really young I, I my parents didn't get along frankly and I used to just wish that they would get a divorce I've heard that I've heard that from more children of divorce than I realized I it, divorce is not something that I paid a lot of attention to until a couple of years ago. And I've talked in the process, I, I would think back and be like, okay, who do I know who has either been through this as an individual or lived through this as somebody earlier in their life? Most of the people that I've talked to earlier in their life express exactly the same thing. Almost to the point where a couple of my friends have said, when they sat us down and said, hey, we're, we're no longer going to be married in their mind, they're like, oh, thank God. They, they finally, now it's, you know, good was the thought in their head. I don't think my kids were right at that point, but I also don't think my kids were surprised. But I don't know mm-hmm. what they'll say if, you know, if they were to switch seats with us 10, 20 years from now. I'm not exactly sure what they would say, but I just wanted to, I'm trying to preserve, I want them to understand happy and healthy relationships and I want them to find that for themselves too. Yes, of course. And to stay married or people say, well, we're staying together for the kids. And it's the worst advice I've ever heard. Out. Yes, I don't think so. What example are you setting for your so. kids if you are in an unhealthy or toxic relationship and you consistently stay? 
I would be worried that the example that I would set, I have two boys and a little girl, that, that I would be setting to all three would be, you just tough it out, regardless of what happens, which is great to say. I mean, it's a good bumper sticker, mm-hmm. but that's not, I don't believe the <sighs> recipe for a truly healthy and rewarding life on both sides, because the relationship, if there's the equation, you know, the equal sign in the middle, there's work on both sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when I was eight years old, I remember this is this is hilarious. But my, uh, I remember sitting down and writing a letter to the president, <laughs> who was pres- of the United president, States. Yeah, President <laughs> Johnson. <laughs> I'm, dating, my time. I'm dating Slightly myself. Slightly before my time. I'm dating myself and saying, "Would you please ask my parents to get a divorce?" You know, no and way. Yes, yes. Did I thought, he respond? For a child, that made sense. <laughs> Did, well, no that that would be some letter to have. That would be. That would be a souvenir. That would be a good way to tell whether or not the White House just sends back blanket like cookie cutter. You get a, a mail. But thank you for reaching out and, and with, with the uh, robot signed uh, White House paperwork. Yeah. So I was appealing to the highest authority. Yeah. Who I, I get knew. It. So I get it. Yeah. So Memphis. So they stayed together. And yep. yeah, I got out, went to college. For journalism, I'm assuming. Yes, I went to the University of Tennessee. I wanted to go to the University of Missouri at Columbia. That's the top undergraduate journalism school in the country. Is it still? Probably, okay. yes. I would I would say so. And uh, instead, I didn't want to pay out-of-state tuition or have my parents pay out-of-state tuition. And probably I was scared to go that far away. <laughs> that was like <laughs> another world. I mean, we had traveled a little bit, but... We hadn't traveled much to yeah. to Atlanta to see Braves games and to Washington D.C. to see the monuments and stuff there. That was about it for vacations. Real exciting. So I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and uh, majored in journalism or majored in communications. I think they called it. They didn't really specifically say it was a journalism major, but that was that was what I, that was all I wanted to do because I'd been on the high school newspaper, written everything, done everything on the high school newspaper. And uh, at while I was at UT Knoxville, I had a journalism professor come to our, he came to our school from New York City. And I, I probably had never met anybody from New York City. And I'd imagine that's probably the mecca of the journalism world at the time. It, it was yes, it def- it definitely was, and his name was John Hohenberg, and he was the administrator of the Pulitzer Prize board of oh, the wow. Pulitzer Prizes, and he taught at Columbia University, which was considered probably still it is still considered the top graduate school in journalism. If you want to do a master's, if you think you need that, so. I had him for a few classes, and he had been a foreign correspondent, which was something I really wanted to do because my junior year I had done that this semester in Paris, and he'd been there like as the uh, correspondent for the International Herald Tribune, and he'd covered the UN. He'd done a lot of these things in journalism that I just couldn't believe, and my peers didn't seem to think anything of this man. They were, he was very distinguished, you know, white mm-hmm. hair and very, very distinguished. Did he have tortoise shell and- glasses? <laughs> Did he have an ivory handled pipe? That's what I'm thinking. It just at Probably, random times yeah, in a conversation just, and bubbles would come out of it. That's what I would use. <laughs> I don't like to smoke a pipe, but I would blow bubbles out of one. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> he had that. Yes, he had that academic. Oh, air I can picture it, and, and like uh, the patches on the jacket, all sorts of stuff. Probably all of that. <laughs> so of course I was very impressed, and I did my best in his classes, and didn't know him that well, but I tried to kind of stand out. And then when I graduated, I took a job as a reporter at the Birmingham Post Herald, which was the Avis, we try harder. Isn't that the old slogan? We try harder. It was second to the Birmingham News, even though it was a morning paper and the afternoon papers were usually not doing as well. But the Birmingham News was stronger and the Post Herald was weak. But I had done a I had done an internship at the Memphis paper called the Commercial Appeal. And so the editor, he had been promoted to the editor of the Birmingham Post Herald, so he hired me because he already knew me from Memphis. That sort of makes sense. Jumped into that kind of backwards, but did you love it as soon as you got into uh, college and everything beyond? You were doing what you wanted to do. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think maybe one of the sure. rare 
I talk to most people about their experience in college, of which I have none. I went high school, military. And most people, when they talk about their college experience, they're like, nah, mm-hmm. I had to do it. They weren't very passionate about They would find one or two classes that they loved, but the rest of it, they were kind of were just putting their chips down until they had what they needed to graduate. It sounds like you actually were enjoying right. the process. You're fortunate. <laughs> You're the minority of people that I've talked to when it comes to that. That's probably true because I did business school later on for a very short time. It's an MBA <laughs> program, and Didn't enjoy everybody, that as much? everybody was going, "I hate this! I hate this!" You know, <laughs> to my right and to my left. So oh, I man. said, "Oh, that's probably not for me." But I like the journalism because it was a craft more than it was an academic it, pursuit. It wasn't real, real academic. It was more putting things into practice. Yeah. Like at UT, I was. They had a. They still do have a newspaper called the Daily Beacon, and so it came out every day. So we had to get oh, used that to that cycle. routine. Yeah. Yes, and and I was editor of that. Worked my way up to that, and we wrote editorials, covered the news, all of the the city politics, That's everything. Awesome. Just Sounds just like, like a, a real great pipeline newspaper. into a, yeah traditional newspaper. And from there, I went. I also worked at the at the same time. I worked at the Knoxville Journal, which was a real newspaper. So that was, I'd already had those real newspaper experiences with the Commercial Appeal. I'd had a, I'd had a summer internship. Um, then later with the uh, Knoxville Journal, I kind of worked there part time. Worked at the Daily Beacon. Worked worked at the school cafeteria to get money to go to Europe, so I could do that Paris thing and spend a semester over there. So. I was always kind of immersed in it, really wanted to to do it, not s- just think about it or, or study. Like, it was important to study the First Amendment, to yeah. study the, the libel law. Libel law is very important, and I studied that. But it, it's also learning to write and learning to write under pressure, that sort of thing. Time pressure, you mean? Yes, definitely. So, What was your favorite topic to report on? When you look back at your career, what was your favorite thing to write about? Oh, wow. There there's just, there've been a lot of things, a lot of things. And even starting in college, I loved any story I was assigned, I just loved. I loved the the people-based stories, character, character-driven stories, you know. I just covered so many and especially well starting down when I went down to Birmingham, this is after undergraduate school under when I graduated. I would uh, cover things like the Ku Klux Klan, and there was a there was a bombing. You may have heard of this. The, I think it was Sixteenth Street Baptist Church. They called it was uh, I'm, six you know what? little I do believe, black children. Yes. That had happened, I'm sure, in the '60s. But this people were still talking about it. We're talking yeah. kind of late '70s, and people still talked about it a lot. There were still investigations going on about who was behind it, that sort of thing. So I covered. So I covered stories like that. I, um, I followed around very, very famous writer named Eudora Welty, who wrote short stories and just so many people. It's just, it's just wonderful to kind of have that access, you know, where people yeah. want want to talk to you, like like yeah, you, you experience, you, yeah. you experience that. And uh, so I had a decent portfolio. Uh, after I went to Birmingham, I worked there for like a couple of years to. Get help me get into Columbia, which was like like it is today. It's super competitive. There were like ten thousand applicants for a hundred and thirty slots. Damn. And that has not changed. That was the same when I applied, and it's the same. Well, that now. says something to you about the quality of what's going on there and the People prestige involved. People still want to do it. Yeah. They still want to do it, even though you really wonder about journalism jobs. Because back then, when I was in it, it starting out, it was like. This is a profession, you know. It's a it's a it's a respectable job. It it you can make an okay living as a salary. You know, you can you can survive. You're not going to make a lot of money. But now, I'm sure, as you know, the journalism profession, if it's a profession, it's in flux. Well, as you just said, if it's a profession, I look at a lot of people who believe because they can record either audio or video or the combination on a phone that they. That they're a citizen journalist, and I, I'm by no means an expert to say whether they are or they aren't, but it puts them in competition with everybody who's also reporting who went to the school that you went to. And it seems to me almost that it's a race to be first not accurate, 
mm-hmm. and the citizen mm-hmm. journalists who are out and about and stumble into a situation, they almost can get in front of the traditional journalists. It's it seems like it's a battle. I don't know if they're helping each other in that battle or they're mm-hmm. slowly eroding the career field in general. Yes, I think there's a lot of corrosion going on there as far as and maybe that's the technology partly because it's the technology's eroded a lot of fields or eliminated yeah. Well com- the speed with which information can get to people is there's no way that a I don't care if it's a morning newspaper or an evening newspaper. There is absolutely no way you can compete with somebody doing a Facebook Live or uh, Instagram Live or anything else like that. There, there's no way that a print organization could uh, get inside of that cycle and be faster. Right. It's just in those things were we couldn't even conceive of those things back then. I mean, <laughs> we imagine. couldn't, you know, we had no idea, yeah. no idea. A global footprint of, within seconds of something happening? No. <laughs> just... <laughs> Maybe over a shortwave radio as it passed along. I mean, that actually might have been the fastest way to pass information. Yeah, yeah, and we just we just couldn't even dream of it. And you know, I remember stopping at the at the side of the road, say in Alabama, and I was covering a story, and there had been a car accident or something. And I had a huge camera with me in the glove compartment. I had to take that out to to snap a couple of pictures and then take the film back to the newspaper and have somebody develop it. And you know, yep. it, it was great because I just happened to have the camera in the car and got some pretty decent shots. But of course, those days now it's a new world now. It's so different, yes, and there, as we've said, a lot of pros and a lot of cons to uh, to both of those things. So basically, when I had this portfolio and I had like, oh, she covered a Ku Klux Klan rally or something like that, that in coal miner strike and they slashed our tires and that sort of thing, you know, and that was, and I say this a lot to myself now, nobody told us the dangers of journalism when I was an undergraduate or in graduate school after I got to Columbia. Dangers, you mean you have to be so close and proximal to what's going on that you can kind of get touched by it or people might seek retribution against you for reporting on something they didn't want reported? Both. Okay. Both. And then some and more and more of the same. So I guess that could have been one of the early experiences. Well, real early in one of my uh, while I was doing the internship at the Commercial Appeal in certain neighborhoods, there was a lot of crime. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd drive in there late at night, maybe to cover a sniper thing. And you'd, I'd see how nervous the photographer was. And maybe he'd had 30 years of experience and I'd had no years not of professional experience. And it was like very nerve wracking. Is there going to be shooting or that sort of thing? And it was certainly possible nothing like that happened but i know that the the coal miners did slash not my person not my tires but again the photographer who yeah. was with me he was in his own car his tires so, so you know you think wow and then i covered also in birmingham there was a real shady guy who had started something like a photography school if you know what i mean i think i do know what you mean <laughs> photographing young ladies and yeah, that sort of probably, thing uh Putting newspaper ads out looking for models type stuff? Yeah, Yeah. that type of stuff. So I, you know, kept going by where the studio was, and (laughs) and I never saw any activity. I never saw a car. I never saw anything. And, you know, it gets very labor-intensive doing any type of investigative work. You know, you go back, and and the editor says, where's the story? Where are the goods? Have you got it? Because you've just taken two or three hours out of the day to pursue this story. So eventually, I had enough to write a piece. I never talked to him, but I had enough to write a decent piece, you know, 12 paragraphs or something like that. And Again, not accusing him of anything. Everything is uh, not just even just covering with allegedly, but just having enough of the facts to put it together and stand by it. And then I hear he's looking for you and he's got a, what is it, a three fifty seven Magnum? Is that, there certainly is, is that a certain it's gun? kind of known as a dirty a hairy gun. gun. Oh, my. On yeah. the front a little seat. Cl- little Clint Eastwood pistol. Yes, he's got that on the front seat beside him, and he's driving around looking for you. Yeah, that's not awesome. And no, it's really scary. Yes. And you you know, you do understand the repercussions of what you're doing, but I think you do. As a journalist, you should. You should. You know what's going to happen if you, you think you know what's going to happen, 
but you don't really. I mean, people can get very upset yeah. about people can get extremely upset about stories even though the stories are perfectly sound and the stories are perfectly fair and there's nothing wrong with them. So that was another brush with, hey, this is um, this could be a little bit dangerous. You know, anytime you're talking about somebody's livelihood, I mean, this case of maybe a very illegal livelihood, they can they can feel threatened. I mean, that's probably the number one way that a newspaper or a magazine gets sued is if they uh, impugn someone's character or yep. impugn their their live something they've done in their livelihood that's that's illegal or something. This kind of sends up red flags and that sort of thing. I can't believe they didn't even for an hour on a day in your progression into becoming a journalist at least talk about the danger. I feel like I in the modern day, that would be a mandatory class. Oh, yes. Of And I mean, you could probably put it under the ethics or legality. It's somewhere in there. Yes. It, it, in the combination of those things. So you can rotate yeah. the chair. You can move the mic stand. You can do whatever you want to do <laughs> to be comfortable, Margaret. Well, I want you to have continuity, but I may have to take this off. Take it off. I don't worry about continuity. Uh, uh, don't use words that continuity. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, and you're and you're editing and that's. I'm not thing. worried about that. Okay. I don't edit it. My buddy Mike, my buddy Mike does. He can worry about that. Good I know. Like time. I said, the AC is of course broken today, so we'll see how far we go before one of us passes out from heat exhaustion. <laughs> yeah, you can swing that thing farther over. Pull. There you go. You're yes. good to go. So. Yes. So. London. You go to school. You're working in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Go to London. Did I read it correctly in the book, or am I thinking of something else? Where you actually. Did you go to any war zones during your time as a journalist? Yes. That's what I thought. Yes. What, yes. Where and what was that experience like? And I just, I never imagined that I would ever end up doing anything like that. That was just, that was so totally crazy. So anyway, I wouldn't have ever gotten out of Birmingham. You know, I'd still be there at the Post Herald, except it closed. It's not around anymore. But, you know, again, I had this bank of stories that I'd done. I had this recommendation from John Hohenberg, who was big at Columbia. The Otherwise, I would never gentleman. have gotten in. And I was kind of a token. There was another gal from uh, Georgia. Actually, her name was Savannah. It's Savannah. And she and I were the token Southerners in the class, in our class, this 130 kids or people who had these somehow gotten in out of 10,000 people who Two applied. out of 130. Yes, but see, that was... It was it's a, a rough time, ratio. It was a time of Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein. And it was a glory day for journalism. It was not like it is now with the, the fake news and we don't like journalism. Journalists and we don't know who to believe, and you know we'd rather. Or we listen to some journalists, yeah. but not the ones who have uh, yeah. facts or opinions that are ulterior to our own. Right, like we know now, you kind of curate your own news. You know, you get your news in your feed that you like and oh, you agree with. Your echo chamber, you mean? <laughs> your little insulated echo. Ch- People don't do that. People don't have confirmation <laughs> bias. I believe that's fake. No, I, I, do, I, I'll do it myself. I'll go. You can pick a, a left leaning organization and a right-leaning, and I won't define any of them because I think they kind of define themselves. And you just watch the same topic described. Right. And you look at it as if, sometimes I look at it as, are, are you guys talking about the same thing? You left this out. You put this in. These are flip-flopped. And you can just see that it's they're taking the information and pointing it in the direction of either their constituents or their consumers. It's It's... Mm-hmm. Not an awesome time. And I don't know no. if people realize if they don't intentionally go and seek information from broader sources, their pool might be starting as a 360 degree pie, but then it's 180, then it's one, you know, 90, then it's 45, and it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Like I said, unlimited access to information, super small optic on the world itself. Not right. good. And again, we just couldn't imagine those things at that time. When 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 I went to Columbia, we we had like Mike Wallace. I don't know if you. I, I do. Uh, Chris Wallace's father, and he was this incredible broadcaster. And we had just these people who would come and speak to our class and talk to. That our would class. be amazing and, to have yeah, Mike oh, yeah. Wallace speak to your class all the time. Stuff like that. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, like my my news, my adjunct professor, who I'm actually mentioned in the book, she was the assistant 
to the news writing professor was Anna Quinlan before she'd written any of her novels. And she was a columnist for the New York Times for a long time. Before that, she was a reporter. When I knew her, she was a reporter at the New York Times. So I just, you know, idolized. Maybe I put him too much on a pedestal, but I idolized these people. And uh, we had access to them. And it was a time in journalism when journalists were still much more exalted like the again powerful the woodward and bernstein and the watergate had just come off the back of that and maybe they made a movie about it and uh it it was uh, the glory days it was journalism can change things and journalism can make a difference and they did have power power. and and hopefully they used it responsibly i don't i'm gonna go out a limb and say not all of them Right. right. <laughs> Only because we're talking about human beings yeah. and therefore inherently flawed. Yeah. I bet you most of them lived up to every ounce of what people want them to be. But I bet you there was a little maneuvering in the shadows, some deals right. made over probably dirty martinis or whatever James Bond drink was, you know. Yeah. L- yeah. Lovable at the time. <laughs> I'm sure there was. And probably all that was going on, you know, way above any type of level that the of journalism that I was in, but I mean, some have fallen on their swords, yep. like Brian Williams, for example. I mean, An interesting who, study in um, how he ended up falling on his sword. Yeah, it did, was it was it was a incremental, microscopic untruths, which is what they were, until it mm-hmm. became something that was unavoidable. And he built it himself. The wall that fell on him, he built. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting how it happened, though, over a very long period of time. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that came much later. But I know that there have been scandals, too. There was actually a scandal of a, a J school graduate who made up a story about a a little boy. This was in the D.C. area who was like a, a drug addict, I think, at the age of eight. It was called Jimmy's World. Oh, no. I think that I, I don't want to know. I don't know for sure that I'm getting everything right but uh yeah and then it was it turned out it was completely had been completely fictionalized and that's so bad it's bad for the whole occupation because it gives fuel to the false uh, news narrative if they can point at concrete things like that it's hard to sit there and say no that didn't happen it's like eh it's right. kind of right there, and it did happen. Right. So that was that was kind of the, I mean, of course, they talked about ethics, and we had, uh, like I said, uh, libel law, First Amendment law is very important. We would take all of that at the Columbia Law School. They hmm. had special courses for us there. And again, it was like my undergraduate and the other work that I had done professionally, and that they just threw us out in the street. You know, we had to... I had to go to Bedford Stuyvesant to cover a story, and it was back in those days. It was very dangerous. It was, you know, and I I just was terrified anyway. They had just had the son of Sam murders around that time, and so the taxi drivers all had big partitions between you and them, big thick partitions. Yes, and I watched the Netflix uh, documentary series on that. Terrifying. Yes, absolutely terrifying. I think they had already. Uh, They'd already captured him around the time I went up there to school. and But I just remember the taxi driver letting me out on the corner of 116th and Broadway and going, you need to get streetwise and you just need to get that really scared look off your face. And I was like, okay. You know, wow. so, um, yeah, that was kind of my, you know, kind of became my M.O. It was like you're the... Well, Betty Boop of the Middle East, they call me when I ended up there. It's like, you know, the kind of innocent, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, nothing bad can happen to me kind of thing. But uh, one, uh, one student did get mugged during our year uh, in graduate school. So, I mean, anything it, it could have happened. It was just a much, I don't know exactly what it's like now. I haven't been up there too many times lately, but it was... Um, just it was not cleaned up, you know, Times Square and all that. Yeah. So uh, we covered we covered all the stories just like we were. And we had a, a service called Columbia News Service that actually put out wire stories that were published in newspapers all around the country. And they would in, at the Commercial Appeal where I'd worked in Memphis, they would grab my stories really? and publish them with the byline and everything. And so that was really cool. And um, so we had. We had a lot of good experiences there, and then that led to after I graduated going to going to London and just thinking 
there are only two ways to be a foreign correspondent in those days. Either you go back to a newspaper, preferably a large one, that had some people posted overseas. You're like, talking about like the Times, yes. the Post, all that type of stuff? Yes. Okay. Yes. Or in those days, Boston Globe, yep. maybe maybe a few others, maybe Wall Street Journal. And, and you wait and you work and you try and you try to get that posting. You do as much domestic reporting as you can that might get you that coveted appointment or the other route you know the other route (laughs) freelancer gun for hire stringer (laughs) yes flying by the seat of the pants kind of thing so also known as a young person's uh, yeah it's definitely something (laughs) you know you don't want to do that with a family to support be a lot of risk if you did yes yeah i feel like that's a young person's game yeah. So that's kind of how I went. And uh, I had uh, some friends who knew some friends who had a place that I could I could stay in and live in in the East End of London, which was like its own world <laughs> very much it was like I went out one day for a jog and it just in, you know, like you would jogging shorts mm-hmm. at the top. But all of these old men were staring at me you know because they'd never seen anything like that that was very unusual for that community in that part of the world I mean I hope I wasn't offending anyone but it was um very much its own culture its own accent it is just its own world I mean in in all of London in those days just shut down at nine o'clock Really? So yes, there were no restaurants except Joe Allen's, which served American food and uh, maybe Indian food you could get. So it was it, it, they just kind of rolled up the sidewalks. So again, I arrived and I was working on stories. I was doing that thing of pounding the pavement, going up and down Fleet Street, interviewing, trying to get uh, gig work, but trying to get other work. So gig economy even back then. And uh, one evening, somebody I knew invited me to come over to ABC and watch the broadcast, which was Peter Jennings recording these links, and then they were fed mm-hmm. fed to New York, not real live stuff. And uh, Peter Jennings had an assistant uh, named Carabel Daniel, and her husband was the AP bureau chief. That's a separate story, but it was all in that world. You could call it incestuous world. But she was from, she's, she was from South Carolina, and so it's like we Southerners have to stick together. So she said, what are you doing? Are you busy? Can you start, like, right now doing something? And so that is, that's that's just how it is. Rhetorical that's how question. It starts. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I said, sure, why not? I mean, so that's that's kind of how I started as a substitute teleprompter uh shoving paper through in those days feeding paper through a machine that <laughs> that you type letters on that are about two inches tall and then the the mechanism to feed it was broken so you had to kind of manually push it through oh no way no you had to manually push it through at what you hoped was the right speed you know even even then technology was thwarting <laughs> us technology was 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 painful yep. technology was killing us so because we were right on the edge i mean to have fax machines and to do an international fax that was a big deal and all the the scripts had to be faxed to faxed to new york for approval no, of course and then sent back so that was that was kind of the the height of the technology and then having like a 10 minute satellite window at 9 45 at night london time to to send all the links if something was breaking we would literally go live but of course you know like you said there's a lot of pressure yeah a lot of pressure with going live so um i just did i did what they told me to do and i did a little bit more and a little bit extra and if there was any opening to do anything else i would i would research something for peter jennings like on on uh, there was an uprising brewing in poland where the uh there was a, a strike there led by Lech Walesa, who was a, a Polish, I guess, nationalist. So there was, there was that brewing, and that that eventually did explode. So I did that. I did that summer, and then I was offered a job back in New York, and it's it was on a magazine called Ad Week, and I was the media reporter. So that was like the ultimate in navel gazing. I hate that term, but anyway, Did you say it navel was navel ga- gazing because it was like the media reporting on the media. 
that's what I was, the yeah. media reporting on the media. And I mean, there is definitely a place for that, and there's some fantastic media reporters out there. It's an interesting specialty, but I just didn't want to I didn't want to do that forever. So I went I went back and my whole life was like going to the 21 Club or going to Sardis or going to uh, the Waldorf Astoria. And that's how I covered stories. And I, I don't want to do hotel journalism. And I don't want to go out to lunch every single day and try to get a story out of that. I, I want to see something and I want to do something. I still had that idea yeah. that, um, that I could make it or could I make it? Could I make it overseas? Did you have any desire or had you thought at all about writing a book at any point up until this time? No, not really. Again, I was so young. I, I mean, that was the thing. I wanted to do all these things at a very young age. And you can't be the youngest forever. You can only play that card for a while and then yeah. you're going to get older. So I thought, well, you know, I'll write books later. But So at least it was a thought. I loved it. Yeah, I love the idea of it because it's like the ultimate in journalism. If you're sort of a journalist who's does short work short stories like if i write a if i write an editorial or something like that it's going to be 850 words yeah if i write a major magazine piece it's going to be 2000 to say 4000 max that's a really really long uh piece of journalism like yeah. for a magazine and uh then when i got into broadcasting and again, I was floundering because I had started at the top and worked, you know, I say I started at the top and worked my way down <laughs> because uh, I did not have broadcasting training and did not follow that track at, at Columbia. They have very primitive film equipment. And it's not that you couldn't, you can make a documentary. You were assigned to, to the job of making a documentary as your project. Mm -hmm. But I stuck with that print track sto totally because mainly because we had so many great writers from the New York Times who were our teachers. Well, it sounds like you were yeah. called to it early on or drawn to it early on. I was like, I want print. You know, print was me. It was my personality. Yeah. But then I thought broadcasting has got a better future, maybe a better... Because uh, even then I wondered what was the future of newspapers going to be like. What do you think it is in the modern day, 2020 looking forward? I think it's I think it's terrible. I think Dying? They, yeah, because I mean they're so they seem to be so stuck between uh, how do they put paywalls up and how do they charge for their content and then at the same time or they want to give certain stories away free mm -hmm. or they which is very laudable. But how do you how do you have it both ways and then you've got all these other competing outlets and comp competing streams of information. I, I think they were just kind of hit. I, I don't know when like early 90s or something or mid 90s but, yeah um, I, I know nothing about journalism but i suspect that the print paper is a, a dying art right i think so unfortunately we'll unfortunately so i mean the good thing about online stuff is you don't have limitations because there used to be very strict yeah. space limitations and maybe your story wouldn't get in because it, it they had too much copy and yours was not as good as something else so this story didn't make it and the story didn't get in but um but going back to london and even in the early days i well i went when i went back to new york it was kind of that well, I just don't know if I can make it. And and they had actually offered me a job to stay on at ABC, and it would have been more in the technical department, which is probably not not my forte, but uh, it was like booking landlines. <laughs> that was the deal back then. To get to get pictures through Europe, you had to book coordinating you had to have confirmation telexes from every country <laughs> along the path that you wanted to send these pictures on oh, wow. <laughs> so it was a very bureaucratic sometimes slow and you want the pictures now and oh, new, new like york anything, wants the pictures now anything other than speedy it was yeah it was like it was almost like the Vietnam War and having to mail back canisters of film and that sort of thing. And we did that sometimes. I mean, we mail back canisters of film. So I didn't, I was like, okay, I'm not going to take that technical job. I'm going to stick with a writing job, go back to New York. And that was when I actually did meet Walter Cronkite uh, covering a story or I turned it into a story because he was standing just 
behind me in the coat check line at the 21 club and i said are you going to retire i hear that you're going to retire you know so i got a couple of comments i could spin that into a story and i, I don't mean spin the way you think of no, spin, I get but it. created you know, or crafted into it was enough yeah. for a little column like this so it was a fun job but i i um when they announced in February of 1981 that Prince Charles and Princess Diana were getting married and uh, Lady Diana back then, you know, I'm like, this is the story of the century, which people still say that is, you know, one of the most televised, if not the most televised event really? there's ever been. I, I think. did not know that. I don't know, but I guess it was like billions of people watching and stuff. That. So that was, that was February. They announced it. Um, I called my boss in London at ABC and said, you going to have any work <laughs> over there with in connection with the wedding? And it's like, yeah, but I don't, again, I don't really want to promise anything. And so I turned up and just, there was, there was just so much work. There was just, there was tons of stuff going on, not, not including the Royal wedding and leading yeah. up to the Royal wedding of five months preparation for that. So so I went back and I just stayed and then I ended up living there for 12 years. I was going to say, your son was born in London, correct? Yes. My son who passed away, he was born in London in 1987. And that was that sort of thing where I had I had met someone and like you say about divorce, it was it was very painful and that it did not, it did not work out after four or five years. And uh, but my son was born over there, and after that time, I never I never went on any war, uh, any more war assignments or anything. But those I had done. Where did you go on those assignments? Well, after sort of after the royal wedding, um, things sort of heated up in the Middle East. There was there was going to be a lot of people said there was going to be an invasion of Lebanon by uh, the Israelis to route out the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. And this this was on the cards and this was coming. So just my boss was like, get on a plane and go to Cairo. You know, it was just, that was the way it was back then. Like you, you never knew what was going to happen. And that was, so that was, that was my first trip to the Middle East. And, um, from there, I I went to I went to Beirut. That was my first taste of Beirut, and that that was where these um, signs that the that the invasion was coming. It was only a matter of time that it was that it was going to happen. And uh, I went back to London and got the day I arrived back in the bureau. Um, Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, had been assassinated in a very very bloody bloody coup thing where a bunch of supposed army soldiers turned on him while he was in the reviewing box watching a parade watching a military parade yeah and they were insurgents but in dress uniform yeah and that was like all this carnage came flooding in over the pictures came in over the um satellites or whatever and you know i couldn't edit that or any new york just kept screaming at me what's what's coming how much worse is it going to get how much worse is it going to get i said i don't know because i don't have control with cairo they're just yeah, you're feeding on the receiving end they're just feeding it blind with no control line or anything no nobody on the other end telling us whose pictures are these are these abc or the nbc or oh, the wow. cbs or they you know so everybody's grabbing grabbing everything so that was um, that con- you know contributed to the tensions I think in in the region because he probably Sadat probably had been killed because he was uh, uh, had made peace with had made a separate peace with Israel and uh, so eventually I ended up I ended up going back again kind of just kept they kept sending me back there and I started doing radio I had started doing radio work uh in London I covered some IRA bombings which were very also very scary because there was a famous one called the Chelsea Chelsea Barracks nail bomb Mm -hmm. and uh where the IRA blown up this bomb and it had all these nails and stuff in it and you never knew if there was going to be a second one there was always that concern that where there's one there might be another one so i was like i was trying to understand that conflict i was trying to understand the ira conflict that was still 
that was going strong. And then I was trying to understand the Middle East, and that was very complicated, the situation in Lebanon, because they'd had a long civil war, like all through the 70s, and they'd had, had, they'd had sectarian tensions for many, many years, ever since the country was created at the end of, of World War I, and it was carved up. And um, so... It just was a, it felt like a challenge just doing that kind of work because it's, it's the most extreme kind of journalism, good way, bad way. I mean, like you're dealing with, obviously you're dealing with some physical danger and mm-hmm. they did not, <laughs> they did, in that day they really didn't do anything to prepare journalists that I'm, that I'm aware of. I think, I think a little bit more maybe is done now, but um, it was you're dealing with language barriers you're dealing with translators you're dealing with maybe your local fixer is uh not honest maybe your maybe your translator gets kidnapped i mean you could things could happen just because these individuals local people were working with you working working for you or working for the network so um i went back to the middle east when the conflict was raging in the summer of 1982 and uh, that was where Israel was going to rout out Yasser Arafat come what may he was just not going to be able to stay there and and hunker down you know so a lot of shelling and stuff like that going on all the time and and a very tense situation again between all the factions in Lebanon which is almost way too much to explain but I couldn't I couldn't do it justice but the shias who are islamic muslims and and sunnis who are christians and other christian sects as well and uh so then there's druze which is an offshoot of of islam so there's all this kind of stuff trying to keep trying to keep all of that straight so um i covered a lot of it from damascus in syria and that was like there was no action over there so i felt like it was that summer it was difficult to come up with stories and then hmm. then also spent more time in Lebanon um, near the end of that conflict where they did route out they got Yasser Arafat and all his PLO guys grab them and go right to the top there you go and then you can pinch them to make them tighter yeah. if you want just there you go squeeze it oh, bam yeah that's You're good in there. yes um yeah, so that he he was put out put on it. They were put on a ship and sent out of Lebanon <laughs> to Tunisia, I think it was, and uh, there was a multinational force that the Americans were part of that that were brought in to kind of restore the peace, and then um, then they left, and then they had to come back because there was a assassination of the Lebanese president that I was there for. So they have these tremendous blasts. When something like that would, when that happened, mm-hmm. that was an extraordinary one. You could feel it miles away when that happened in East Beirut, because the Lebanese press, president is a Christian, so Christian, the Christian side of Beirut is East Beirut. You could feel it all the way over on the west side of Beirut, and you just go, "Wow, something, something bad is really, really bad has happened." So there was hard to describe that unless you felt it. A lot of yeah, a lot of shooting, a lot of. Uh, that was one of the most frightening things because I had to go to the east side and then they were all in the Christians over there were enraged that their leader had been killed so they were looking for revenge and uh, so they like for example they grabbed my cameraman's camera and grabbed the they didn't keep the camera but they grabbed it they pulled the cassette out it was cassettes in those days and in shot you know shot it up and I was so scared yeah I didn't want to get separated from them but I was like backing up against this hospital where I think we thought that uh, the president of Lebanon um, had been taken to that hospital and I was just luckily I could like blend in with the crowd I didn't really stand out sometimes mm-hmm. it's kind of helpful I think it was kind of helpful to be a woman. it's often helpful when you don't stand out. Yeah, yeah, so because I have dark hair and everything, so I, I just would blend in. I'd blend it in, but I didn't want to get left. 
and I was like, I don't, I don't really want to spend the night in East Beirut. I've got to get back, so I've got to get with them. I've got to jump in the car. We got to make it over the green line. We've got to get back, no matter what. Type. But it was so. I wanted to stay in East Beirut and hide because they were shooting uh, yeah. the whole time. Uh, it was we were trying to get across different checkpoints and that sort of thing. There are checkpoints everywhere to get back to the west side because that's. That's where the journalists were, most of them. Some few were on the east side, but the communications were better. But again, we're talking extremely primitive yeah. compared to what we have now. We had telex machine. We had wire service. We could see what the AP and the UPI were filing. Uh, we had ways to file stories via telex, but we had to obviously had to use lines or at least phone lines to to do broadcasting, do broadcast tracks. Yeah. It's very difficult to get pictures out. Did you find the work there in the war zones fulfilling? Yeah, I think it is in a in a weird way. You know, the whole time I was thinking, I want to tell the American people about this. I just want them to know what's going on. And I want to be objective. And I'm not trying to color the story this way or that. I don't want to skew it. I just want them to understand that this conflict to yeah. to understand what's going on and to know also too when when the americans were there it was probably of more interest and more stories because um we had the americans there direct involvement the marine amphibious unit and it was about 800 of them or 1213 total because there were some there was some navy there were some french there were some uh brits it was all multinational so uh, they went out, but they, at the end, when Arafat had been taken away, they came back in after the assassination of the president because everything was was in turmoil, and they stayed. But it became what's known as the quagmire <laughs> because they accurate term. I I think that's a good <laughs> accurate for yeah. for that. Yeah, because they it was like everybody was going. They're going to get bogged down. They're going to get bogged down in this, and uh, and they did so. I guess I just I just couldn't get enough of it, but I I hope I wasn't like a war junkie. But there's always that risk, there was that danger, and I I think there were definitely uh, some individuals who were war junkies, and as journalists, there's soldiers who are war junkies. That environment, yeah, has yeah. a gravitational yeah. pull to it in very different manifestations depending on the individual. But I know guys right. who who cannot right. put the spurs up. Mm -hmm. They will get out of a military career and they will go into a contracting career and they'll switch an yeah. issued uniform for a rented uniform or a bought uniform. They keep going back overseas. And it's it's something that I think you have to be aware of and that you have to manage it. Each and every person, I think they respond to it differently, but there's a draw for sure. Did you, did you ever feel that way? <sighs> yes. And... I, it manifested in me in really during that time period where I was consistently going overseas of an inability to detach my thought process from thinking about you would get back from a deployment and you start thinking about the next one instead of mm -hmm. spending the time to put the car in neutral for a little bit coast take your foot off the gas reintegrate into family mm -hmm. Maybe work on yourself a little bit. Take care of some things that you need to take care of. And mm -hmm. you just get, um, it's exciting. It's fulfilling. You feel a sense of purpose. It's a tangible feeling overseas, directly interacting with people and being able to take them off of the chessboard and make a difference. It, it will get a hold of you. And it's tough. And it didn't, until I got hurt, which was a forced break from that, mm -hmm. I don't think I realized how much my body might have been in other places, but my, my mind was still in that area thinking about that. And again, that's just a different manifestation of that magnetizing pull. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think journalists experience that too. Oh, I, I, it and makes total sense to me that they would. Yeah, they do. So a lot of them, you know, they get to be known for their war experiences. And, and of course, you kind of want to send somebody to a war zone who knows yeah. the lay of the land. So, you know, kind of by but you a need fluke. To be able to, you need to be able to navigate your way out yeah, of that, you too. Yeah, you do. You do. You can get stuck. You can get really, yep. really stuck there. So I had I had done that stuff in, in 82. There were just, there were a lot of... Uh, frightening and traumatic experiences with being in Lebanon during that time. So I came, I came back out though. I was still based in London. I still con I considered myself. I was based in London, 
but I just kept going out on limbs, you know, and I decided to go back and I, I, I went freelance. I left a job that I had at ABC as a radio radio correspondent to just go again, like I, like when I originally ri- arrived in London, just totally freelance. Like I had some gig work lined up. I was working for RKO Radio. I don't know if that exists. I have Voice of America. Um, I was working for IRN in London, Independent Radio Network. They call it one of my friends. I had a really good friend. She, she, she woman. There were some women out there. She was the ABC correspondent, but she wasn't going to stay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to know how long anybody was going to stay. She wasn't going to stay indefinitely. So I thought, well, I'll just have this work, and then when my friend leaves, maybe I'll inherit that job, and I can. It'll be more more work and more stability and that sort of thing. And kind of like, I know what I'm doing, and I'll go out there. But it was a really, really hard. It was during what they call the reconstruction phase of Lebanon, like the Civil War reconstruction, I think of. And they were trying to rebuild the country, and they were having peace talks, and they were like, you know, everything's going to be good, and, and it's all good. But it just didn't feel good. It did not feel good. It felt like... It's going to get bad. Mm -hmm. I was like, the Marines are here and they're going to get, they're going to get hit. I always had that feeling and we were not embeds. We never had embeds back then, not to my knowledge. Uh, Maybe they did for for organizations like Stars and Stripes or whatever they had, you know, official, official, obviously they had official publications, but we would go with Marines and occasionally go on driving around through the refugee camps and stuff in Lebanon and and people started throwing things and it wasn't good and (laughs) we kind of understood I don't know if we understood more than the Marines maybe that sounds really arrogant I'm sorry but if it does I don't think so well it depends on how isolated the military units were in their interaction with the local populace versus it sounds like you were out in amongst the local populace so you yeah. probably had a better idea of the environmentals and the pattern of life and all those things so it's very very possible we did on that on that from that standpoint you know we were talking to women and children and yep. all that kind of stuff all the time and uh so this was this was in the spring of 1983 and um it was it was just hard living there too. You know, we had electricity cutoffs, we had water cutoffs. I lived in a very small apartment that had like rats. I'm sorry to say, and um, I put tape all over the windows <laughs> because of car bombs. Yeah, you know, I was so scared to hold the windows in. Yeah, I was real. I didn't know what I was doing though. You know, I really yeah. didn't have experience with that. And uh, then um, in that spring in April. I went to the U.S. Embassy to renew my credentials or something to see uh, the consular guy who was in charge of the journalists. And I was sitting in the lobby, had to sit in the lobby waiting on him for a while and then got that taken care of, left, went to London to have a break, like for a little bit of R&R. And the embassy was blown up. I'm sure you remember that. And it was really massive explosion so i saw that on tv and i think from seeing that from london and i saw my friends like doing their journalism and the carnage and the just the expressions on their faces they look in obviously they were in shock they could have been experiencing ptsd or the beginnings of that so i thought i was just sitting there just a few days ago in that lobby it throws it in your face it's pretty real that was really scary. Not not like anything like the experiences that you've had, but... You know, one thing I will say is uh, your experiences are yours and mine are mine, and they should never be compared. And that, and that includes experiences in war. I hear... I got an email this morning from a man who was talking about uh, a diagnosis that he has with post-traumatic stress. I don't call it a disorder. I think it's a natural reaction to stressors. And he said he felt felt feels guilty that it comes from a non-service related he never served Mm -hmm. so he feels like he can't say he has post-traumatic stress because it's somehow the bastion of soldiers and i wrote back to him i was like listen stress is stress your body's reaction to stress is your body's reaction to stress the fact that you've recognized it is a great thing you can do something with it but don't compare yourself to other people all you're going to do is set yourself up for failure your experiences are yours and they're real for you Mine are mine, as are other soldiers. And I think it's very important to take people as an individual. And you don't have to go to war to experience post-traumatic stress. 
period, in my opinion. Having said mm -hmm. that, I did not go to medical school, but that is how I feel about it. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's really hard to say what what an individual's experiences, how they affect them. And obviously, some the journalists had individual experiences. Yes. And some people maybe didn't share their experiences. And some people may have struggled. And, and Well, I think it's important to realize, too, that the same experience can drastically impact one person and another person. It, it's water off of a duck's back. There's... I mean, I, as far as I know, there's less known about the human brain than there is what is known about the human brain. But one thing in talking a lot with psychiatrists and psychologists when I was getting out of the military, and I still talk to a guy every Thursday, it's, you know, the comparative nature is, is insidious and it's dangerous. And just because two people experience the mm -hmm. same thing, you shouldn't ex expect the same outcome, nor should that individual. And it's okay for somebody to not be bothered by something that bothers somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because you'll see that and you're like, well, you know, Bob is having a hard time. Is there something wrong with me? No, there may not be something wrong with you. But there might be something that bugs you that Bob's going to be totally fine with. The, the, I think one of the first steps towards heading in the right direction with that stuff is, is cutting the cord to comparative issues or mm -hmm. uh, the manifestation of any post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway... Um I, when I saw the, all the, the carnage at the embassy, and I was in London, and I had a chance to take another job, a different job, uh, working for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and uh, working on documentaries and that sort of thing, I just, I didn't go back. I didn't go back. I don't blame you. I didn't have much there, you know, I had a, I had a really tiny apartment, like I said, with rats and tape on the windows and <laughs> the sliding door. It was awful. And no hot water or no water. That's not good either. And uh, so I just got somebody there. To, I said, when you're coming out, just bring me just bring me my stuff. You can just get the key from somebody and go in. And, and so they did. And uh, I didn't have to go back. I mean, I could have, but I, I just chose not to. And then six months later or so in October of that year was when the Marine base was blown sky high and the largest non-nuclear explosion since World War II. I think they might have and just had one that trumped that. In, where was that, where the explosion uh, was a, I should know this, but it, there were, I think there was a larger one very mm -hmm. recently. It was in the Middle East yeah. too. It was yeah, uh, huge. Was the one in Beirut, the one down was at it? the port. Yeah, there where you go. they had all that. Was it like fertilizer or something? I don't know what like, it was, um, but it was obviously combustible yeah. and flammable. Yeah, yeah. And I think that probably exceeded the size of the barracks uh, yeah. bomb, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. But in the, uh, you know, the people there have suffered so much just yeah. to think that that probably was not an act of terrorism, even though when I first heard about it, of course, I did think that it was. That was my was. initial thought as well. I, I haven't seen anything yet that pinned it on terrorism. I'm not sure. Trust me, the listeners will correct us if we are <laughs> wrong in that sentiment. I assure you. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I was glad I wasn't there when that when the when the barracks got oh, blown yeah. up. I had only been there maybe once or twice for like press briefings, and it was just I just I just felt terrible for them, and I was, you know, it was just devastating, and uh, and so we got out of there a little bit like we finally got out of Syria. I think last year we know you know we finally pulled out of there, and it was just it was inevitable at that time that that Reagan was going to uh, pull pull the troops out and not not keep them there but I think to the local people it, it signals can signal a lack of commitment on the part of the United States sure. like yeah. we're here but now yeah. it's cutting up rough and we're we're going to leave now and you know but they're thinking of the domestic base and if you get more casualties like that and it was it was just such a tragic thing and it was uh it was Islamic Jihad, and uh, they call themselves, but that was Hezbollah. That was the beginning of Hezbollah. And I say that because eventually I interviewed someone, not the top, top guy at Hezbollah, but in the 2000s, like the second in command. And so things happened to me later when I interviewed these world leaders where people domestically didn't didn't like that it's mm -hmm. it's hard to do that without looking like you're you're pandering to them or you're glorifying them or you're 
you know, you're trying to make them look good. Don't let them have their say. But it's still, yeah. if you're a journalist, you're still supposed to, in my opinion, interview if you can, if you can talk to somebody. I think you should pull bad ideas into the light. The way mm-hmm. you beat bad ideas is with better ideas. Sometimes I think ideologies need to be wiped off the face of the planet because mm-hmm. some of them are just hell bent on destruction of everything else. And the economy of ideas is not going to fix that. But I, I'm willing to listen to just about anybody from just about any position on what they think because it mm-hmm. challenges my thought process, my belief, where do my ideas come from? And I think the more that bad ideas are drawn into the light, mm-hmm. the less foundation and framework they will have. Right. It's tough though, like I you agree. just said. It's it's difficult to do that and it's not very tough. Yeah. And not um, not give them a platform or whatever. So so I say that and I was back I was back in London. I was working for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I was doing all different kinds of well, I was I'd I'd been hired to work on a five or six hour documentary on George Orwell uh-huh. uh, for the whatever it was. 1984 maybe it was 1984 so it was something to commemorate the actual book he wrote 1984 and this was the year 1984 and how much of that was how much of that had come true you know like big brother and all of that yeah. so we set about interviewing every every living person who knew him in oh cool in the uk in or or even say in canada or whatever anybody who had any contact with him so we did a lot of that that was different for me I'd never done that kind of real documentary work and then I I covered a lot of different subjects for them but not always uh, some war some war related some Middle East related and I went back to the Middle East in 84 85 and interviewed uh, Queen Noor King Hussein's American wife Hmm. and met them both and that was that was a very acceptable story because she was American, and I was, and of course, King Hussein was a great ally of the United States, so it was not the sort of enemy. But all this time, I had been trying for a year or two to get an interview with Hafez al Assad, who was the president of Syria at the time, but he was not media savvy let's say he was yeah. he didn't speak english and he was very distrustful of western journalists of any type and that so, one probably wouldn't have gone that well <laughs> no go out on a limb there. <laughs> no so i was trying to pull contacts for that to get that to get that for for abc um and it never it never did pan out and then um in 19 a couple of years later in 1986 i took a job with a a, a agency it's agency journalism which the public doesn't always know too much about because the agencies are sort of behind the scenes and they feed material to all not all of the networks not directly competing networks but they will uh, supply material to clients so like cbs would be a client or Mm -hmm. cnn or this this agency was called worldwide television news and prior to that it had been called upitn it was owned by that news agency upi which folded and only the ap the ap was left and reuters was was left and uh, so that was again sort of some connections to the middle east because i was hired based on the fact that I had been there and they said would you go would you go back and I said well I was I had been asked to do a story uh, by the CBC again on the reconstruction of Lebanon this was story was still playing out in 86 mm-hmm. as as it had been in 83 when I was there so I said well you know the mistake I made was saying yes I I was thinking about going for them so they were like well then why won't why won't you go for us and all you have to do is fill in for a couple of weeks as the bureau chief just sit in the bureau babysit everything you send the crew out maybe you don't have to really no heavy lifting and um, I said well you know okay maybe I would and uh, they ended the the agency uh, WTN said ended up sending a an Irish guy who was named John McCarthy who I never met because when I was hired he was I guess he by the time I came on he was already in Lebanon filling in and he'd never been there before and I had and he was kidnapped mm. and he was held for like five or six years 
And again, That's I'm rough. backtracking. Prior to that, I'm sure it was prior to that, in 85, I think it was, um, a friend of mine had been kidnapped, Terry Anderson, who was the bureau chief for the AP What did in they Beirut. want when they were kidnapped? Were they looking for a ransom? Yeah. Or did they want uh, a change politically or both? Both. Okay. Yeah, both. So it, it became this rash of kidnappings. Again, that, that spun out of me being there in 83 and the, and the embassy bombing and the feeling the Marines were in danger. And I was feeling the kidnappings were starting. They may have started. I, my memory is not great, but say 83, 84, 85, they took uh, academics, professors for, from the American University uh, at Beirut. They took they took them um, sort of like the Iranian hostage thing, you know, which was a big thing in 79 and mm-hmm. 80. And that's, that's when I was in school and I was just starting out, you know, at ABC and uh, one correspondent made his name, made a great name for himself just because he had an Iranian uh, visa and he could go in and cover the access. hostage thing. So that became everybody's thing was if you see trouble brewing, go and get a visa, you know, go and get a go and get a Polish visa. If you think there's going to be the uprising there, make sure you've got a valid visa. You'll be the one who gets sent if you've got a valid visa. So. This was still going on. The kidnappings, it was like 79, but it was not a mass kidnapping. That's kind of what I wanted to say. They took a group from the embassy en masse, 50 or 60 or however many. And then in Lebanon, they just started picking them off the street because that was all they could do and following people around and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it just, it did not feel good. So by 85, 86, Terry Anderson, who was a colleague, I didn't know him well. Uh, I knew his the woman who became his wife, but I didn't know him really, really well. But he'd been taken. He was being held. Then I was asked if I would go, and that's why I was so leery. I was like, I don't know. I just still don't don't feel good at all about being there, going there. And then John McCarthy was sent, and he was kidnapped. And I felt a certain degree of survivor's guilt. I felt if they had sent me, not that I was that experienced. I wasn't. I mean, I had been there a total of half a dozen times and lived there for, say, three months on one of those occasions. That's a lot comparatively to somebody who lands there and is yeah. taking everything yeah. in live yeah. their first day on the ground. For sure. And yeah. he was like, um, you know, raising a glass in a home video, kind of having a toast and relaxing. And you think it's the Paris of the Middle East and these beautiful limestone buildings behind him. He's with some people maybe from the bureau, people he's just met. And it was just so fatalistic to see that last clip of him, like raising the glass and and how badly it was going to end. And I also, again, I just didn't think I would be kidnapped. Maybe you have to think that. And and some nuns had been kidnapped. So it was possible yeah. that a woman could be kidnapped. I was f- fooling myself to think otherwise or or killed. But um, Was he released? He was, after, but it was a long time. Okay. It was like five or six years, and my boss felt so bad. And he suffered the survivor's guilt, and it was – it was very hard on all of us who were back in yeah. the London Bureau because it was that thing kind of like the coronavirus. You don't know when it's going to end. And if you're that captive, you can imagine you're captive. You don't you don't know when it's going to end. Yeah. And it, it tests you. It tests you so much, I think, uh, psychologically. I just can't even imagine. But I did, I did feel guilty about it. And I had been told once by Islamic leader that uh said we would cap the uh, women would never be ca- kidnapped because it's not it's it it's a degradation of the act of kidnapping it's like we would sooner kidnap a dog it's not worth it hmm. <laughs> I'm going, okay that's good i'm glad i don't want to be kidnapped so i don't know how um, true that is though no that might I, have been I don't a way know. for them to get yeah. around talking about the actual risk yeah yeah but they they claim they wouldn't i don't know for chivalrous reasons or or other reasons so I it, it could like give they you weren't chivalrous no, reasons no <laughs> yeah you have experience you have experience uh, with that yeah i just wouldn't i wouldn't apply the term chivalry no. anywhere near kidnapping usually they have their intent is far more malicious yeah so 
I think survivor's guilt, I bring that up because I think as a suicide loss survivor, you always feel, you feel a certain amount of guilt that you carry with you and you say you've known people who've who've taken their lives that um, the woulda, coulda, shoulda, what, what if, or what if I'd done this, or what if I'd done that, or just that feeling in that situation with John McCarthy that it could have been me and yeah. um, or if I'd gone this wouldn't have happened and it it just radically changes the course of your life if you're held hostage for five six seven oh, years yeah. or uh, or a month or I know or I how know about kidnapped a ever, few days probably. it's yeah. just to be it's very very traumatic and I just can't imagine how how people deal with that and so I certainly don't have an answer to that. Um, I've seen people who have dealt with situations like that well and others that where it has unraveled their life completely. Right. And everything in between, actually, as well. Mm-hmm. So shortly, you know, it sounds like you have a, a pretty good amount of experience there. And then you said, though, the birth of your son was pretty much mm-hmm. the end of that. That was the end of yeah. your willingness to go into that world. Yes, that didn't that that just didn't feel like the right thing to do. But mm-hmm. yeah, prior prior to that, I had also been um, I had been to Iraq. I had very briefly met as I met Saddam Hussein, <laughs> which I didn't think that was going to happen. You know, I used to go to the guard houses around the presidential palace and just wait to say, you know, I'm here. I'd love to have an interview with His Excellency. Blah mm-hmm. blah blah. Again, kind of playing the Betty Boop. I, I'm kind of naive uh, person and trying to be very patient. You know, I'd wait. I'd wait for hours just to just to get a glimpse of anything. Mm-hmm. You know, just the slightest thing. So, um, I was there. Went there for a went to cover a women's convention of all the international women's convention where they were trying to show how progressive the Iraqi women were at that really? time. They what were not. Was this? this was, um, I think, it was eighty. Four or eighty-five, huh. somewhere in there, and and they were. They didn't wear. They didn't wear the hijab or different types of veils very much. And they didn't wear um, the hijab when no. you saw them, or all the time. Um, My experience mm-hmm. with some of those events mm-hmm. is that when you show up for the event, mm-hmm. people behave in a certain manner that is different than how they would behave before and after the event. Yes, there's a showmanship aspect to it. Yeah. You could show a small section in a controlled environment of somebody or a group of women being incredibly progressive, and then that particular portion of the world erects specifically pretty suppressive to women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, like I said, it was kind of it was kind of a show of look look at how yeah. progressive we are and that sort of thing. And then we were we were taken to the parliament building, and they said you're going to see. Saddam Hussein. I was like, yeah, right. I didn't believe it. You know, I didn't believe it because I, I tried. Have it, yeah. No, I tried <laughs> so hard and so many times, and it was so out of the question, and it was never going to happen. And uh, so, it, but it did. We heard him make a speech like Castro that went on for hours and hours and hours. And uh, then there were just like these uh, Iraqi cheerleaders in in uh, uniforms chanting, and it was all just it was a, quite a spectacle. And we got to meet him briefly afterwards and. And I was just kind of like put next to him, and you know you're kind of you know you're being used like you'd yes. be used if it were if it were a real interview you're being used, but it wasn't anything really that I could do anything about, and he yeah. didn't speak English well. But I asked him some questions about the Iran Iraq war, was what was really going on at the time, and that was raging on the border and down south and in the marshes and the Huayza march, marshes, and then it, it became while I was there, I kind of became trapped there. So the conference was over, I became trapped, and the war of the cities broke out, oh, and that was yes where. The Iranians were shooting like the missiles, I guess, and they're they're guided and Probably one scuds. Yes, and they could travel several hundred miles oh, yes. or something. And one hit a building that was right in line with my hotel. If it had not hit that building, it would have hit my hotel. Okay, and we're talking about like hotel journalism kind of thing, and. Um, you never know what's going on, and they often try to confine you to the hotel, mm-hmm. or not literally confine you to the room. A lot of, a lot of blasts and stuff going off, and a lot of, you know. And then we travel with the Iraqi army. We travel to in a helicopter down to the border to see the fighting or see what a wonderful job they had done killing all the Iranians. And they probably you got into an Iraqi helicopter. You're very so scary, very brave yeah, woman. Yeah. 
and the other journalists were scared too. You know, because you we guys could, had reason to be scared. We could smell <laughs> like the petrol fumes and stuff like that. You just like, <laughs> yeah, just sitting on the floor of a helicopter, and just that, <sighs> just that smell, and knowing there's fighting going on, like the the, the shooting back and forth of of rockets or missiles going off and you're in the air and that's in the air and then they just showed us the, all of these bodies that had some people said they've been kept in freezers so they could drag them out for this showing i mean that's gruesome i know and um it's logistically complex as well but i'm yeah, just trying to think my way through that i don't know but there were so many rumors that they were booby trapped too so i'm mean, not that we were going to go close to them so yeah. it was like a friend of mine put it just a really grisly it was a very grisly war and that was my only real look at it the journalists did go in and cover it from either side they mm-hmm. go in from the iraqi side or they come in from the iranian yeah, exactly. side but at any time either country could prohibit you, you know not recognize visas not allow you in the country unless you were doing what they wanted you to do yeah. and seeing what they wanted you to see information is key in those environments right. those countries will want to or they will take you to places that paint a narrative that they want to have told, not necessarily the truth. I know, and it's so hard because unless you speak Arabic, and I'm not great at languages anyway, and I'm, I could speak French some, but um, it, you don't know what's going on. You're dependent on a translator. One day my translator did disappear, and he never showed up. But he never came back again. So survivor's guilt over that. Then when I got the, the picture... A day, the next day after having my picture made with Saddam Hussein, it was propaganda, you know, look at how wonderful I am with Americans and, and all that. And But we were kind of, as a nation, the U.S. was kind of having a detente period with Iraq at that time, if you can believe that. Like yeah. uh, Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense at the time, and they were talking with Saddam and, you know, getting cozy, getting cozy with Saddam because he was seen as the bulwark or Iraq was seen as a bulwark against Iranian fundamentalism pouring over the border, especially in the South, where you would see the women in the black, the hijab or the full Mm -hmm. black dress. They would tell us, you can't take a picture of those women. Don't, you know, because I always had my camera, still camera with me too. So knock on the door, the hotel room door, and somebody gave me a big, or they left outside the hotel room door. It was just left there. It was a folder in, in Arabic gold embossed letters on a leather cover. Open the thing up. There's the picture of me and Saddam. And there are other people in the picture too. So several copies of it, several copies in this nice folder. I take one, take the fingernail scissors, cut out just me and Saddam. <laughs> And then I stick it in my passport. Just instinct. Instinct tells me to do that. Just do, it might be handy. Keep that. So uh, a few nights later, I was walking with some NBC folks. We went out to one of the fish restaurants, and Muka Barat stopped us, pulled us over. I mean, they we were we were walking. They pulled up in a car and said, "Get in." I'm, it That's going to be a hard pass. So scared. Yeah, I was so scared. So. I, we got in, and I showed them the picture, and they let us out. <laughs> they it's put us call. out of the call, a car. And, you know, it was in that time when, or earlier, even in the early 80s, Saddam, there were always talks talk about him having a double. Yes, I've heard that You've as well. You've heard that? So, mm-hmm. like, parades, you know, we used to study the footage because we study hours of footage coming in. And, uh, you know, here he is waving from a, uh, the back of a car or something and from a certain distance you think yeah they probably could get away with a double it'd be pretty easy mm-hmm. and uh but i when i met him and i say that you know ask him a few few uh questions real quick like you're really winning the war aren't you isn't that great you know <laughs> um i was so close to him it couldn't have been a double there were so many people around as soon as he finished giving his long 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 speech like three or four hours the deputies they call them like the parliamentarians Mm -hmm. they just rushed the floor and just surrounded him they were like there was like no security that i could see but we'd all gone through metal detectors so people were you were able to touch him come right up right up to him so i was closer than you and you and i are well definitely so I don't know that they could have gotten away with a double. I don't know how good they are able to do that yeah, stuff. Yeah, but I'd it was possible, one of those folklorish things that might or might not have been true. So that was that was kind of that was my time in Iraq, and then 
I didn't, you know, just to round out the war experiences, I, I didn't go, I didn't go back to the Middle East when, by the time Gulf War One had broken out, and I had reason to go, especially to go maybe to an offshoot place like Jordan. I had been to several times in, in Damascus, in Syria. I had been there many times, and uh, but I, I didn't think it was the right thing for me. Uh, just it was not something I was comfortable with. Mm-hmm. I know one American uh, female journalist who has done that sort of thing. She even went to war zones when she was pregnant, like with her third or fourth child. And that, <sighs> that's ballsy. I, yeah, that's. And I'm not. I'm not condemning that because everybody, yeah. like you said, well, everybody she has, to make has her own their, their level, their their comfort, their comfort zone. And um, no, I didn't. I by that time I had moved into celebrity journalism. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I believe that's described as hell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing nothing about journalism or have being mm-hmm. haven't ever been a journalist, I would imagine that would be a pretty tough row to hoe. Yeah. So <laughs> they just they just came to me one day and said basically, nobody wants to do this job. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, another guy set it up and he was a very hard news freak. Were you like, back in the US I don't at this do point? This. No, I was still in London. I was still working for the agency, Worldwide Television News. So we're gonna do entertainment news. So that's I said, Yeah, I'll do it. I mean it fits with I could stay in London almost all the time. I could do assignments, but I also could farm them out i was the executive producer like my husband said so i could hire freelancers to do what i did not want to do if i really wanted to do something i could but even that i kind of found stressful uh just because my son was really young he was born in 87 so Mm -hmm. he was like two three four years old at this time so i didn't travel to events like say the Cannes film festival but i had to cover that for had to make sure that was covered Mm -hmm. for uh, cnn the Hollywood Minute. Of course. I mean, it's so critically important what's happening <laughs> it's there. It's so important. And uh, Entertainment Tonight yeah. was, one of my, was one of my big clients. And E, the E Network. Oh, I've seen. It big, was big. Far too many shows on both of those networks. So I just started filling my head with bubble gum. It was like, you know, are we going to get this interview with the star? Or is that star going to have a tantrum? Or is, or is their publicist going to have a tantrum? Or are they going to, you know, cooperate with us? What are we? So, what a shift. Yeah, it was really, really extreme. So I just went from one extreme to the other. I really, I, I wanted to, I did want to change. If I hadn't wanted to do it, I wouldn't have done it. I would have just stayed in news. Yeah. What brought you back to the U.S.? And then my my marriage ended, and that was about in ninety two, and my son was uh, my son Kieran was four years old at the time. My mother was very ill. She she had had a stroke, and uh, there really was no one to care for her. You yeah. know, you could say it it falls on the daughter. I mean, not not the always, family, yeah, but, but yeah. it it. it it does. It can. It can fall on the daughter. I have two brothers, but um, so I, I moved back to take care of her. And uh, I tell one of my brothers, "Don't, don't come back because it's not going to be good for your career." So I returned to Memphis, and and that was that was culture shock. You know, I tried not to see it as culture shock because it was home. I feel like it would be impossible not to see it as culture shock. I've been away so long. I had been away so long and, you know, 12 years, it, it's not great for your career. Like if you're on this career path, like say you're the net, in, with the network, but you're a local hire, pretty, pretty much was that was what I was. It's hard to get back with the network, say, in New York. You kind of die yeah. on the vine. You stay there and you maybe hang on and you could die on the vine, that sort of thing. I uh, was offered a job in New York at, at CBS uh, mainly because of my entertainment experience, because I knew how to cover the Cannes Film Festival, <laughs> and they wanted that. They wanted that for the morning shows. So I how had all the contacts. How crazy of a world is yeah, it that I that mean, is valued more yeah. over your international wartime yeah. correspondence experience? Yeah, this yeah. world that we live in is completely on its head. It's crazy, and I mean, <laughs> I knew people so at backwards. say, for example, I knew people at CNN well, and CNN was my client as well with the Hollywood Minute, and they had been my clients before. They were a client of the agency Worldwide Television News, 
uh, you know, that I went down there and interviewed in Atlanta, and they said, well, why should we hire you? Because we can hire three kids for what we have to pay you, Oof. and which wasn't a lot anyway. It was yeah. just, you know, not a huge amount of money, but, but experience wasn't valued, I guess is what I'm trying to say, kind of plays off of what you were saying. Yep. That and, and I would say experience does matter. You have to get on the job experience as a journalist. You have to know what to do, how to react in a certain situation, and you're not going to know your first time out. I mean, I probably, I know I made a lot of mistakes. How would I, how would I know how to cover an IRA, IRA bombing when I was like 24 or I didn't in a foreign country, even London, even not having the language barrier, it, uh, there, there were a lot of ex- experiences I had, and other, and other journalists had too, and they might not have been valued for their experience. They too might have died on the vine, or they might have, they might have gone into PR work, or they might have gone into something that was either safer or more lucrative. Or, um, but that was that was kind of going back to my earlier uh, things that I was telling you that. I'd never realized the level of danger. You know, I never realized that people were going to threaten me. Like later when I wrote about Saddam, you know, my encounter with Saddam, that kind of thing. It's always good for a, for a yarn, you know. And I wrote something about it for the Commercial Appeal, and they published the picture. And then uh, I get letters, which are threats. or But they're letters to the newspaper saying yeah. if, if Hitler were alive, she would be interviewing him in his bunker. What do you think? I would want to interview Hitler because then I would interview him and then beat him to death. And that way it would kill two birds with one stone. Wow. You had to get the interview up front, take care of what needed to be taken care of. I've actually been asked often any historical figure that I would want to sit down and do a podcast with. And I would want to go to Hitler pre-war before his ascent to power, pick his brain a little bit, and then choke Mm -hmm. him to death. Oh, wow. But that's just how I think. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I feel like I, I wouldn't say. be that way. I don't, I'm not. I'm not violent. I would just wimp off, you I'm know, and thank either. him. Thank him for the interview. Here's the thing, Margaret. I'm not violent either. Yeah, until yeah. it's time to be violent. Right. And then when it's time to be violent, you need to come to the table with more violence than anybody is ever expecting. But I prefer right. not to do that until I have to. Right. And Hitler deserves some violence. Do you think there's ever a time and a place for a journalist to be violent? Yes. Off the top of my head, I can't give you an exact specific example, but I feel like there must be. Maybe. I would say maybe in defense of their life or their safety. Yeah. I mean, that would be a good time to respond with violence. Yeah. We were kind of like, you know, like I said, we were never in beds, but I did wear wear flak jacket when I was in Iraq because we had so many bombings and explosions and stuff flying all the time that CBS gave me one. It it lent me one, but it made me feel more like I was involved in the war not, i can see that you know and i that, can see that i think journalists try not to wear them you know if you're in an environment that has things flying around ballistically it's probably not a bad idea right you know it, why not add a piece of equipment that could potentially save your life even from, though they're hot and heavy and hot and heavy is better than fast piercing and hydraulic fluid leaking out i know so that is so you gotta, scary you gotta balance it that's you know, when you hear things flying, yep. bullets flying, it's so very, very scary. And that's what I was always saying in Lebanon. It's like, who's shooting whom and which way is the shooting coming from? And the incoming was the the incoming was the little piercing noise. And then the outgoing was the big booms, right? It depends on what you're talking about incoming and outgoing. Bullets, when they go by you, they snap. Um And if they're shooting, people are shooting next to you, you'll hear the report of the rifle going in that direction. But when it goes by your head, it makes a snapping noise. Mm -hmm. The louder the snap, the closer it is. You can hear mortars and probably rockets flying through the air. A lot of times they have fins and you can hear the fins of it cutting through the air. It makes a pretty particular uh, and distinct whistle. I didn't have the experience to pick any of those things out. That's good. That is good you didn't have the experience (laughs) to pick those things out. (laughs) <laughs> no, so from that standpoint, I couldn't I couldn't cover the actual sounds of of that, but it was so it could be so dangerous that somebody I remember a driver or somebody pulled me back from a balcony because I was so over eager to get the sound. Yeah. In in ABC radio, we what you heard was what you got. 
we were never allowed to put sound behind us. Hmm. That was different from NBC and I believe CBS, who if they had the technology, they could go and dub in, dub behind the sound of explosions oh, see, or rockets. That's a or, no-go. Yeah. That's, that becomes editorialized. Yeah. That's not the news. That's a presentation at that point. Right. So we were, it was so strict that Which I think you could is be good. fired. You would be fired for that. Good. So you could be in a life threatening situation, as I'm sure you can imagine. And it's just, a, it's just a sniper's bullet whizzing past. Or it's just a minor little sound that you're risking your life for. And you got to be talking over it while the bullets whizzing by, or maybe there's a shell or something like that. But you just talk, talk, talk continuously, hoping that something is going to happen behind you. But not too much. Yeah. <laughs> Not too much where you end up being. That sounds insane. Yeah, it is insane. <laughs> <laughs> that, is sa- that is crazy. But it, it was honest. It was yeah. honest journalism. And the others had their reasons for doing whatever they did. But it was Did they disclose honest. the fact that they were dubbing the noise in the background? And no. see, that's the issue that I have. Yeah. You and know, I like, hey, too. we're going to we're going to create something to you can hear the sounds of whatever mm-hmm. they might need to say. I would have, mm-hmm. it has to be disclosed. Otherwise, it's anything but transparent. I agree. And I do like now that it seems like journalism and like you and I are talking now, it's, it's much more natural. It's much yeah. less heavily edited. It's just, it's just like people talking. And because when you are editing, you are editorializing. Well, you're changing the narrative too. You can craft left, right, mm-hmm. center, whatever direction you want to take with. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some pretty amazing editing tools. And then with the uh, introduction of artificial intelligence, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it's going to it's going to get pretty wild. That's what I read something future. about that just yesterday or something where, of course, pictures, photographs can be really doctored. Yes. A lot. And they're working on that with audio as well. Mm-hmm, Basically, mm-hmm. they could take this podcast, however long it will be, and look at the words that we say and then start rejumbling them into statements that neither you or I said. Right. Scary. So that's the technology going too far or maybe becoming not, not becoming a good weaponized tool. perhaps. Y- yes. Yeah. Boy, that's that's the word for it for sure. But we c- still, you know, I go back to we couldn't even imagine the different things. If you go back to graduate school, I did my thesis on a typewriter. And, and that's just that's almost it's the most valuable class I took in high school. To ma- imagine typing. Yes. <laughs> Me too. Let's think about it. What skills do I use every mm-hmm. day? I'm typing mm-hmm. every day. Math, English, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have had a class on taxes. That'd be great. Anybody listening in the school system, let's do that. (laughs) How to balance a checkbook, uh, responsible management of debt, income. Like, come on. There's some classes that we can have. You do wood shop. I'm sure that everybody's going to make a picture frame. How about we Mm -hmm. teach kids how to balance a checkbook? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I needed that for sure. And then when you know the technology was imagine being in these war zones and not having a cell phone not having you know we we started to hear about the technology and how you could set up a field thing that was kind of probably a a lot of it was military technology fly away and then from there you could beam your you could beam your pictures out because it was always difficult getting pictures out of these countries because the television station would be closed or blown up or something like that and audio was not good you couldn't really they didn't want you to use a phone line that was bad so you tried to set something better than get something set up that was better than that but i mean i remember the first time really dating myself but that's okay i don't care uh <laughs> the first time i saw a cell phone i was with, i remember it too I, I, do <laughs> you like, yes what was yours experience? well the first one i ever saw i think was gordon gecko in wall street i was like that thing is crazy oh wow the first one i ever yeah. saw was like a brick yeah. that was a little flip and i'm pretty sure i paid a hundred bucks for 30 minutes something like yeah. that the ridiculous per minute plans that people like i gotta go oh, mom wow. hang up the phone because i like i got six minutes that i can use here i'm gonna go into a penalty minutes wow yeah oh, wow. it was uh late 90s mm-hmm. i remember the first cell phone i ever bought was at uh, horton plaza in san diego why that sticks with me i have no idea but i know exactly <laughs> where i was they were def- they definitely seemed useful. I was with a freelance cameraman and he was a very expensive cameraman. You had to hire him by the day. It was like a thousand pounds for the day, which was a lot of money. This was like early nineties. Still a lot of money. That is a lot, yes. Yeah. Um and he because he was a uh 
well-paid cameraman he had bought a cell phone it was very large like very large one of those big things and we were standing in piccadilly circus in london and he said look at this this is my cell phone and i said wow you know can i make a call on that (laughs) to the office and he said well it's 10 pounds a minute no thank you no i said no i don't need to talk to the office that bad but the potential you know i saw that and i could just see the potential was there and we could see that potential in video as well because we had to do uh, linear editing all the way through most of almost all of my television career we did not have we did not have digital you know we were scrolling scrolling tapes back and forth and and editing (sighs) so what you laid down you couldn't go back and lay shots over once you'd built oh wow once you'd built a, a piece with so many shots you could only drop a shot in if it exactly covered what you'd already laid down. Imagine if you just had a so, nice MacBook Pro back then. Can you imagine? <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and if you did, if you edit. did have one back then, imagine mm-hmm. what we would have today. Mm-hmm. Because we're making advancements, be leaps and bounds. So fast. Yeah. That is a fascinating mm-hmm. career path that you were on. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of up and down, and then um, and then I did get married to a, a British gentleman who was in television probably you know that wasn't his nationality or the being in broadcasting that those those were not the issues but uh i decided it was better for my son and for me to go to return to the states yeah that was that was really a tough decision because my whole life was over there in london and my friends and formative you know formative relationships that you make like through your i know you have and or mid yep. mid mid early 20s mid 20s that sort of thing yeah 20s to 30s yeah to go home and take care of mom and then how do you how do you relate to the people i thought i could relate to people everywhere and i always tried to land on my feet when i went to places like one time the only time i've been to africa i went there i was the first i was told i was the first broadcast journalist to report aids in africa you know i was like just land on your feet deal with it deal with the locals i was alone i didn't have a producer even you know that type of situation so i go home a few years later and it's it's a hard adjustment i could really relate yeah i think to um to service men and women trying trying to readjust the pace is different um mm-hmm. you know things that are important in a war zone they don't even present themselves in the civilian world oftentimes which is a good thing by the way um mm-hmm. it's just it it's a different rhythm i guess would be the best way to describe it there's a pace and cadence to the music overseas and then you get back and it's the beats per minute is drastically reduced and it's it's a mm-hmm a difficult transition for not all but many and um almost impossible for mm-hmm. some unfortunately mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. uh i say it pretty often you know if you go touch war it war will touch you back and not everybody can recover from that and it will change you and you should expect it to change you it doesn't mean it has to destroy you but for some people it does yes you will be changed you you want to think that you won't be i mean maybe I'd if say you're not changed by war as a journalist yeah i think you're, you're a sociopath yeah yeah that's probably i think that's i think that's true yeah and to have it to do it over to voluntarily be i guess anyone's voluntarily um in the army or in the the service now but to to go over there and have that experience maybe you think it's not going to affect you you think i'm going to be the one i'm going to be the one who's not going to be affected or I just don't want that. I don't want that to be my identity, but it is your identity because you can't. It you can't can escape be. it. I think the services do a much better job in the modern era of trying to dispel that allure or mm-hmm. dispel the misconception that people think that it's not going to have an impact. Mental hygiene, mm-hmm. mental health. As I was leaving the military, specifically, specifically the special operations community, was ramping up their concern and emphasis on both of those things there were people there to talk to they had programs in place not only for the service member but for families and kids and retreats and it it was becoming part of the holistic cycle Mm -hmm. so the military does some things very well others not as well and i think they're trying to take the not as well health perspective mental health perspective and put that into the very well category but it it will take Mm -hmm. time Mm mm-hmm 
It will take time. I think I could have gone, you know, sort of gone into denial about it because I had my child to to care for. I was not that I was not that person anymore and I think a lot of it was people couldn't relate to my experiences, so it was not there was not there wasn't anyone I could share anything yeah. with and they would have thought that it was odd. I and, think that's common. Everything you're describing I believe is common. Yeah, so I married, I remarried, I married my husband, Tim. Um, we got married fairly quickly after I moved back. We had known each other as children, and our families knew each other. Our brothers and sisters knew each other. The families were oh, close friends. Oh, I read friends. about him in the book, and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed <laughs> pilot with a piercing gaze. <laughs> Excellent yes. description. Damn, he, he I want to always... be described in a book like that someday. <laughs> Problem is, I have brown hair and brown eyes, so it might be a slightly different description. He always says he wrote that part without me. Hey, you know what? He wrote it well. He wrote it well. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had two children. I had, We have a son, Matt. How old is Matt now? Who's a great fan of your podcast. And he's he's 25. He's turning 26 later, awesome. this, later this month. And... Uh, so it kind of, I'll get to what he's doing in a minute. He, um, it, it kind of became this real happy ever after story. It was everything, sort of like everything falling into place. Mm-hmm. I, I went back to Memphis. We had a very happy home life. We had two boys seven years apart, but they were very close growing up. And... As I say in my book, the world looks different now, that kind of thing. It certainly fits a lot of these scenarios that we're talking about. It, that kind of rosy picture lasted for a few years, but then we could see that that our older son, Kieran, that maybe he was having issues, but we never had any diagnosis, firm mm-hmm. diagnosis of anything. And uh, so things kind of snowballed with him and uh i i say in the book that i i didn't talk to my boys about these war experiences like that you and i've been talking about and so much of it's come back to me now but you know i didn't because i didn't want them to have a mother who was weird or or to think wow my mom's really different from all the other moms i don't talk to my kids at all about any of the experiences that i've had unless they ask Mm-hmm. My rule with them is I'll answer any question that they ask me, obviously age appropriate answers, but they, when it comes up, they'll have a, a fleeting moment of interest and I'll give them the best answer that I can and then they move on. And I'm totally fine with that because I just want to be dad. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be dad's experiences or dad's old job title or any of that. I just want to be their dad. And if they're curious later in life, we can sit down and have deeper conversations. But at this point in their life, you know, specifically two boys, 16 and 15, they're mm-hmm. worried about their world and their world only. They're like, oh yeah, I do have a dad. Maybe I should check with him with, you know, once every month just to make sure he still has a pulse. Right. But it's, I don't think it's, again, I think it's natural to not talk to your children about those experiences. Mm-hmm. They, they wouldn't have had any context to understand them, really. No, they wouldn't have. But I was conscious of being that mother who was different from like all the other the soccer moms and the football moms and that kind of thing it was different but I I totally think what you're saying is true that kids are focused on themselves and that's a healthy thing and they should be and it should be about them I didn't want to put myself front and center I I felt growing up that sort of that my mother was the center of attention she was the attraction she was she was the she was the female doctor she was the woman doctor and if you as the parent are taking up so much space and so much oxygen your children that's just my opinion and i I agree with you they're not going to have the room and the space and the oxygen to flourish if the parents just totally well let's be honest regardless of of, i mean an occupation is exactly that it shouldn't define who you are and my metric for success when i'm laying on my deathbed will be did my kids make a positive impact in the world that they were in, regardless of what that world is. I don't care what the Mm -hmm. job title is. It should be about them, and it should be about them doing better than I did. Mm -hmm. So basically, Kieran, my older one, he, um, he did not do very well in school and struggled and 
we got him set up to go to college. He did go to college. He did well on standardized tests, Mm -hmm. but not well grade-wise. And it didn't last in college. He didn't even make it through the first semester. You broke down the issues well in the first chapter. Um, it sounds it sounds like he struggled. I don't know any other way mm-hmm. to put it. It seems like you picked up on that pretty early on as parents. We did. I think you, you keep hoping things are going to get better, but then you have the teenage years kicking in and, and the uh, challenges associated with the teenage years, and it, and it doesn't <laughs> exactly get better. people who don't know what those are, yeah. if you have kids who aren't teenagers, mm-hmm. just wait. <laughs> just wait, and then send me a note when you realize what we're talking about, when we say the challenge of teenage years. Yeah, yeah. So are They're hard enough as it is, perhaps, would be a good way to put it, in addition to any other uh, issues that your kids will have. And your kids are all going to have issues. All three of my uh, children have quirks. I have quirks. I got my own stuff that I have to work my way through. Mm -hmm. I just have the benefit of, you know, 42 laps around the sun, whereas they're at 12, 15, and 16. Mm -hmm. So he dropped out of college, and he had met a girl, and they ended up getting married, and they had a child right away. And that when he was young, so he was... Early 20s, right? Yes, he was uh, barely 20 when his daughter was born. And, of course, I think that was that was a stressor, too. And he decided the thing to do was to enlist. And he Had researched he ever talked to you of... about the military prior to that? Because no, I, re- I was reading that he... in the book, and there was one question that I had as I was reading last night is, I was curious for me, my parents knew I was going to go into the military. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, my mom's side, the military brat on the Army side, dad's side, naval service from him, his dad, his dad's dad. They didn't talk me out of it at all. I don't know if they were necessarily uh, thrilled at my occupation, but I had been talking about it for seven, eight years before I even went. Right. Kieran had not really mentioned it at all. No, not really. The only thing we knew was that, as I say in the book, he he loved the Boy Scouts. He loved doing that. And uh, he loved being outdoors. He yeah. loved all of that kind of stuff. But um, no, he, I, I think it was a desire to provide for his family, to try to have something that was a secure, uh, a secure job and uh, a hands-on. He was better with sort of the hands-on type stuff. Than doing the than doing the academic work of college and sort of like I was more hands on doing journalism that sort of thing he uh, he kind of needed that so and the military will do a great job of providing exactly what you're yeah. talking about the first and yeah. the fifteenth are mm-hmm. I mean it doesn't get any better than that a government job which is exactly what the military is food housing healthcare and Later on, so for me, I would have. I look at college if I would have gone when I was 18, I would have crumbled. I didn't have it, I mm. didn't have mm. the discipline, absent oversight of you know, I, in high school, your teachers actually want you to succeed. Mm-hmm. My teachers are awesome. From my understanding of college, the teachers don't care if you show up, mm-hmm. it's a you mm-hmm. know, the paradigm That's true. shifts. And it, me, yeah. I went into a community of people that were. I mean, I understood work ethic. I wanted to be in that community. There was nothing that was going to stop me, but I didn't have that mentality about school. Mm -hmm. And I say all this because the beauty is if you are, you can get a lot of trade skills from the military. And like I said, the pay, the healthcare, the benefits, and also as you mature through your early formative years, probably more for young adult men, I would say, than women, the educational options are still there. Mm-hmm. I would do fine in college now or I would have done fine in college in my mid to late 20s. And that's because of the I had that safety net of the military. So it does provide those things. Right. But you have to be cautious that the military will get their pound of flesh as well. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think he saw that. I mean, he might have been a little bit cynical thinking, I'm going to use the army to get what I want out of, you know, to get the benefits or skills or and whatever. you can, however pound of flesh and the military right. will get theirs up front right. you can get yours a little bit later on the military mm-hmm. will get what the military needs first because there was this part of him in high school and everything especially where he was kind of like a 60s hippie type you know he was intrigued by the anti-war era of vietnam he liked the 
he liked Bob Dylan. He liked the he liked beat poets from the nineteen fifties and sixties, and he liked long hair, that sort of thing. So he kind of had to do a real big one eighty, or you call it, to to become the to adopt the military persona. I think was. Mm-hmm. It could have been kind of overwhelming for him. It seems like as soon as you put that uniform on, you're you have that persona. You're you're part of some people of, more than other. But yeah. One of the first things that they do, I can only speak for Navy boot camp, mm-hmm. which is very different than Army boot camp. Very very different from Marine Corps boot camp, and I have no clue what they do in the Air Force when it comes to boot camp. But one of the first things you know that you have to do, everybody. The military is a cross section of society, and it's. If you ask me, I would say that our society is a very me-driven society. Look at me on Instagram. Look at me on Facebook. Me, mm-hmm. me, 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 me. The military needs to be more of a we. You know, the mission needs to take priority over the individual needs. So a lot of what happens in those first months, depending on how long boot camp in, is is a breaking down of the individual and a rebuilding of that team philosophy and mindset. So to mm-hmm. a degree, yes, mm-hmm. you you become that you persona in the military and Mm -hmm. some people grab onto it harder than others though and a lot of that depends on where they come from if they people who played organized team sports they take to the military Mm -hmm. incredibly Mm -hmm. well intelligent people take to the military incredibly well um people i would and this is totally anecdotal but you know that struggle with uh interpersonal skills probably a little bit more Mm -hmm. difficult communication skills poor communication skills probably a little bit more difficult but it's the role of that entry into the military is you're coming from me and you're going into we, being whatever branch of the military you're in. Right. And that was not easy for Kieran. He was not good at organized sports. He was not physically very well coordinated. He um, he he was much more individualistic, like, like skateboarding, liked, um, it was kind of the romantic poet individualist and it's like you said you're working for a greater good you're working for a common goal you have to learn to work with others and those those are really important skills i think and and so that we could see that the army wasn't necessarily a bad thing for him it wasn't a bad path for him because ordinary college just didn't seem to be working yeah well for him how much time did he give you as a heads up between he first started talking about this or thinking about it from when he went and signed on the dotted line? Six months, maybe, maybe a year. Okay. So relatively rapid. And, and we were not, he was not living with us. He had married and he had moved to middle Tennessee where we live now. What was he doing for a living at that time? Like working at Walmart or Sam's or something. And, uh, so he, didn't like that he hated that and uh so he was became one of those kids who was was hanging around the recruiting recruiting station kind of learning i mean was he doing like national guard where you start going something like that you start going twice a month or i don't know exactly um, how the national guard works that sounds correct but but even to go into the national guard from my understanding and for national guardsmen if i'm messing this up i apologize but i think you have to go to boot camp, mm-hmm. then you go into the right. National Guard. So I don't know necessarily what he would have been peripheral to or involved with there. Yeah, I'm not sure, but he did. He did go to regular. He did go to regular Army Army boot camp, and uh, he'd been talking to us, but not in person, mainly over the phone. And we didn't feel. I say we, my husband and I, we didn't feel we had that the right to say that much. Because he was married, and um, say that much in relationship to what to to pros and cons about it, to mm-hmm. just questioning was this really right for him? I mean, uh, my husband Tim went to the Naval Academy. He went on to, to flight school. He went on and became a pilot. So, and he, his grandfather was in the Navy. I mean, my my father was in World War Two, but we were we don't you know we're not really military yep. background yeah, that's like generational or, lineage. Not too I know much. People are like, I go back not to the much. Civil War. It's like, damn man, yeah, branch out a bit or that, don't you know whatever that's you're something. into. Something. So we didn't have that, but I don't think we would have been anti him going into the military. But we would have had we had reservations, and we tried to voice. 
those reservations. And I think that's fair. 20 is not mm-hmm. that old. I look back at how much I was absolutely certain that I knew when I was 20 years old. Mm-hmm. And it was um, pretty much nothing. That would be the best and most apt description. I thought I knew everything and I didn't know that much. And my parents did have hesitation with me going into the military. And they and they mm-hmm. we would have conversations and they could bring up concerns and we could work our way through or around, depending on how the conversation went, the concerns. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad you at least voiced how you felt. That's From my understanding, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, it just seemed like we were on a freight train or the, he was he was going to go in that direction and he spent hours and hours and hours researching all the branches of the mm-hmm. military. So this would be the best way for him to go. This would be the best deal. Uh, that would be the best deal for him personally. And uh, so, but he he did enlist and he was very excited when he, when he got in and it, he went to boot camp at uh, – at Fort Knox and wrote letters because I think they make them write letters. So he wrote letters like Probably. almost every day. Like hand, handwritten. Proof of life letters. Yeah. Hey, mom, I'm okay. <laughs> wink, wink, send <same> cookies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think they made us write letters too, even in, na- in the Navy. Yeah. So he he did say things like, I think in a weird way, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying this because he, he was – doing a lot of outdoorsy things and um i meant to ask you this what year was this that mm-hmm. he enlisted uh this would have been i think 2009 so post 9-11 i entered mm-hmm. pre-9-11 where the thought of what happened on september 11 2001 it i if i had been a fiction writer and you'd give me an unlimited amount of time i don't think i would have come up with that particular manifestation of it All right so people who enlist and I saw this when I was a BUDS instructor. Um, some of the BUDS instructors have a, how dare you try to be who I am mentality or a holier than thou mentality. Mm-hmm. And I'm, my, I don't think my approach or thought process was necessarily catastrophically different, but I saw young men volunteering to go into a occupation in a community who by design the execution of their job is combat operations, which for the military, about only 15% of the U.S. military engages in direct combat. Mm-hmm. But it's a different mentality to go into that in a post-9-11 world than it is a pre-9-11 world. What were his thoughts on potentially deploying overseas to a – because at that time there was still Afghanistan and Iraq deployments. So is that – what do you mean by it changed before 9-11 and versus after? I'd just like to hear So before 9-11, I feel that – the military could be viewed as more of a foundation for a career later on. Mm -hmm. There would be people, and and this is still possible to this day, but there was such a gap in kinetic activity, a mature theater of war. I remember, you know, one of the biggest things they would talk about up front would be the educational benefits. It's a ladder out of a social, socioeconomic Mm -hmm. position, wherever you're at, you could get vocational training. You could get a solid paycheck. You could retire if you wanted to. You could take the educational benefits. And there was a concept of war based off of movies that you had seen, but there was nothing Mm -hmm. that you could point at the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, which lasted about seven seconds. Mm -hmm. That was really it. Mm -hmm. Versus somebody who grew up in a world where on the news there are vehicles burning, reports of IEDs, embedded reporters watching gunfights, seeing Mm -hmm. tracers going back and forth in real time. And by that point, 2008, 2009 in Memphis, I am sure that you probably knew people or families that were directly touched or impacted by that war. There had been enough time and the country had been war long enough. And the decision to join during that time period, to me, Mm -hmm. there's no, I don't put a value judgment on the pre or the post, but I feel like the person joining post 9-11, I have a lot of respect for that. They know exactly what they're getting into. It's no longer just about the college benefits. They're volunteering for the armed services in a time of war. I don't think he understood that, Kieran. As, even if he, and he was very intelligent, but even if he told you, yes, I understand that. Yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that he could grasp it. And that was the whole thing that I say in the early part of the book. Here's mom lecturing on the phone 
uh, you are going to go to Afghanistan. I don't want to give you bad news, but I know that it's going to happen. And he's saying, well, I know these ways to get around it, and I can do this, and I can do that to get out of it. I didn't I didn't And that's feel an interesting approach. That he could. Well, so two things. There would be no guarantee that he would have to deploy. Mm-hmm. Um, it, by 09, 10, it was the surge had already gone past, so the number of troops going over there, I guess in theory, was diminishing. It took longer, obviously, than, I don't want to say promised, but that politicians got on their you know, stump speeches and, and talked about. But the military is big. You know, the ch- he may not necessarily have deployed over there. But two, it, and for anybody listening, considering going into the military, if your plan going in the military is to try to manipulate a system to avoid a deployment or to, devo- to avoid a, you're going to go into the armed forces, but what you're going to try to do is pull on some levers and change to get, make sure that you may not have to execute the roles and responsibilities of your job, I would highly caution you against the decision that you're making. Mm-hmm. That's not a good decision or you're, you're, it's not, it's not a good mindset in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If you believe that you want to go into the system, but part of your plan, your overall plan is to try to manipulate the system once you're in it to achieve your particular end state. I mean, the army is a deployable unit that is by design, it fights wars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you have to look at that objectively and holistically. He wasn't looking at it that way. He wasn't. And that was sort of the beginning of the beginning of the end kind of thing. I don't know how I could say so with such certainty that I knew he was going to be deployed. I don't know what I was reading. I would imagine any parent worries about that. I didn't realize Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in thinking, I've known you're going to come up here now for a couple weeks probably. And I was reading the book last night and I was thinking about my own parents and the realization that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really have this conversation with my mom. She passed in 2010, but I don't have really any idea or understanding of the stress that I put on my mom and dad. Yeah. It's, uh, I was worried about myself and not the the effects of the people that were, that were around me. And it's, uh, and I don't think anybody in his position necessarily thinks that, but I'm sure that my mom, when I, told my mom and dad that I wanted to go into the military. Those were probably her first thoughts too in a pre 9-11 world. I, mean, that's, I think it's a completely natural thing for you to feel. Well, I tried to express it in my writing and I don't know if it was clear at all, but um, you know, I tried to say that I wasn't, when I talked to him and I said, I, you're going to go to Afghanistan. Or somewhere else. Or somewhere, I mean, yeah. yes. I mean, at that time it could have been Iraq, but then Iraq ended about 2010, is that right? Or nine or 10? It never They're really in, ended. or it didn't it never end? There's still no. people there. There's yes. still there's still people there now. Yes. Okay, so um, I just felt that he would be safer if he could really grasp reality. You know, if he could really come to grips with this, it, at least take the worst case scenario and then work back from that. But he had been uh, chosen to be a medic. And how did uh, he do on the ASVAB? He he did great. Is that that's the army entrance exam? I believe it's the same for all. It's the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude B yeah. board. Very very high. I mean, I know I'm what they call to me uh, when I received information about this from the army. The army entrance exam. He missed like one question out of more than three hundred three hundred fifty questions. Jesus, he missed one. Did one. he want to be a medic? Did he have any inclinations Again, earlier on in life about uh, trauma medicine, emergency medicine, anything like that? I only said you might be interested in it. Um, you might be interested in being a medic because maybe you kind of got that from my parents. Grandma? Par- yeah, grandma and granddad, too. You might you might like it. And I don't know if I encouraged him saying go down that road, maybe go down that road, or if they, if they kind of recruited him for that. But when he scored so high on this exam that was – well, at the time, it was they give you that exam before basic, I think, even starts. I'm sure they do. Before they have, it even starts. The military mm-hmm. will give you that, from my understanding, the, or at least when I went in, they give you the battery of tests up front so they can at least put you on a pathway for the right. first probably six months to a year because they're going to they're gonna invest that time post boot camp, your occupational training. 
Right. So as I say in the book, he says, you know, I scored so high, they, they are talking about me as officer material, whatever that means exactly. And uh, then later we find out he's going to AIT, they call it, mm-hmm. Advanced Individualized Training. Which I believe everybody does. Yes, everyone has to go to one. And I think that the ones who score higher or the ones who are considered smarter, they're amongst the medics. I do not you know. Have, I don't know. But I think you have to be, um, you know, it's it's a thing, honor sort of to be chosen for that. So I tried to encourage him as much as I could. I said, you know, this is good because you are good. You're going to be good at these, these things because your grandparents were doctors. And uh, so he went to uh, Fort Sam Houston, had his AIT. But before that, in basic, he wrote letters, a lot of letters to me, and some just to my husband and not to me, but my husband did show them to me. Uh, I'm not sure at that time, maybe he did or later. And he said, um, you know, it's really starting to hit home. We're doing these exercises with the um, officers, the people dressed in Iraqi, Mm -hmm. uh, dressed as Iraqis, and we're trying to defuse these IEDs that are on the side of the road. And if you see a strap, over the guardrail or something on the side of the road and you see the two straps it means something's been strapped could be to yeah. to the, so they did that kind of thing they did a whole lot of with with people really dressed up like like the Iraqis and it it hit home to him it hit home and he was he was having I felt in those letters even he was having trouble dealing with it or painting it as too uh, too rosy a picture and then I think feeling already feeling trapped in different ways trapped personally trapped I hey I'm going down a path and I can't I can't get off this conveyor belt I can't get Mm -hmm. out of this path and go a different path and so at that was at basic we went up for basic uh graduation and took his wife and daughter with us and uh you know i was of course i was so proud i was really proud and he'd really accomplished something and he hadn't in so much in high school he really hadn't had many opportunities to feel that sense of accomplishment and i could see what the army was doing for him but i would also have these thoughts and i write about that in the book you know middle of the night wake up thinking i should call the army and tell him that he's just not suited he's not suited for this and what number would you have called? I have no idea. That's the problem. Army? Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> where do you start? What do you, you know, they're going to listen to a mother. It is, it's an overwhelming probably, organization. Yes. It's overwhelming. It's just, it's a monolith. In the book, I call it a monolith. It is to a degree. And by the time that he had begun that process, the wheels were in motion. I don't even know who you would have begun to call. And the reality is, I don't know. he was given the battery of tests. He performed well on the battery of tests. He signed on the dotted line. So they may they may have, unless they could have diagnosed something that was disqualifying, they probably would have not. They would have taken your call, whatever, 1-800-ARMY, whatever number you would have called, but they might not have, slash probably would not have done anything with the information because the right. number of mothers out there concerned about their son beginning an Army pipeline in post-9-11 world is voluminous. But how many call up and say... <laughs> Let my child out. My child should not be in the army. He's not suited for I think this. Very few, if any, but I bet most, if not all, feel that way. Yeah. At least it, for a fleeting moment. I mean, you're getting like a yeah. sine wave of, this is great for my mm-hmm. son. Oh my God, what has possibly happened? It's mm-hmm. building character. It's doing great things for him. He's not prepared for this. I think every, and you know, we're talking about mothers. I'm sure fathers experience it exactly the same way. Maybe, again, different expression. But I'm sure my father, as I began my journey through boot camp and into the SEAL pipeline and what happened post 9-11, there's no way that I can only I can only imagine the number of sleepless nights that I provided for my parents without thinking twice about it. Right. And he did. Kieran did for us, too. A lot of sleepless nights, a feeling of kind of helplessness, but also seeing that it was it he was benefiting he was not benefiting from other paths or going to conventional college and that sort of thing so you, you he the was an adult is a he great was, option for a lot of people 
Mm-hmm. You'll get structure. You'll get discipline. You'll you'll understand them. Right. That doesn't mean that right. just because you're in the military you have those things. But it'll be laid out in front of you. Work ethic, integrity, honor, courage, commitment, all the the core values. Again, easier to say than actually live. But mm-hmm. it's a it's it's great for what the military is. It is a really good foundation starting point as an option for people should they choose to take that option. Right. I think it would have done me a lot of good. And I think a lot of us as journalists, we were not disciplined. You know, we didn't have that that militaristic discipline or anything. I think it's I think it's good and it would help a lot a lot of young people and uh, so uh, after basic and during AIT, he uh, called us from Fort Sam Houston and said, I want out. Did you say why? And that was more terrifying than me thinking of me calling the army and meddling, meddling in this. I don't think he did really. Um, I don't think he did, but I found out later that there was uh, a sergeant who was one of Kieran's best friends said he was too much in everybody's faces. He was too, Kieran too hard. Was, Kieran that, was too much in people's faces? Or no, the, oh, the, gotcha. there was uh, one of their trainers, a sergeant. Very who was, overbearing? Yes, that's the word, overbearing. And I think he was putting it mildly for, for, yeah. my, for my benefit. And so he, he says, Kieran's friend says, in the, and I say in the book, that um, we all wanted to quit. We all wanted to. It was not. I, I read it as it's it's Kieran. He's he's cracking in the mm-hmm. sense that that he wants out. Finally, those feelings of being trapped, feeling trapped, and feeling conflicted. And I'm not sure I want to be in the army. I'm not sure I want to be in a uniform. I'm not sure I want to do any of this. That that had just finally overwhelmed him. But his friend told me later, and this was probably after. Kieran's death for sure if not before he had said that um well before it would have come from Kieran I guess that um and not from his friend but he said that uh they they all felt that way that it was just it was just too much that was probably the role that that particular person was trying to fill there you it's better to and this is not an excuse for that person playing that role but it's better to sweat in peace than bleed in war. Most of the training that I have done in the SEAL community has exceeded the physical and psychological demands of an actual combat environment. And the reason that they do that is if you're going to get to a breaking point, it would better happen in the United States in a controlled environment and we can build you from that or through it or around it or whatever it may be. So I don't know who that person is or exactly the situation, but we're talking very close post boot camp, so very early on in the military and i would say for your first few years in the military they're more overbearing than receptive or passive because they're still trying to mold you if you want to use clay as an analogy so that might have just been that individual's role right and what he was because if everybody was feeling that way that leads me to believe that that was the part of the pipeline that they were working their way through and i think it you know to a certain extent it happened in basic just because they were trying to prepare them so oh, it well it definitely happened in basic uh, to go to afghanistan it was just like really really this is real and this is what it's about and if you don't do this you're going to get killed and it was they were he understood that part of it he was no. like i know they're trying to they're trying to keep us alive they're trying to you know do everything they can for our benefit to let us know what it's going to be like when we get over there and I say in the book, I wish, you know, that I sound like I'm living vicariously through my child in a weird way, but I was like, oh, I wish I'd gone to Afghanistan when I had the chance, because I did. Because they used to send people from Beirut, of all places, you know, you think that hmm. may seem kind of weird, but from Beirut, they go into Afghanistan and come out. Interesting. Not stay there. But of course, that was during the Russian, during the Russian war. And uh, I, I said no twice. I didn't. I just was like... I think it's too, too tough for me, just the, the the terrain and being, you know, it wasn't maybe hotel journalism at that point, but that I still just wanted to, I just, I didn't want to experience what I wanted to know what he was going to experience, but obviously I couldn't except really by reading about it. And, but I wanted to tell him what, 
you know, what it was going to be like. I wanted to wake him up, you know, I kind of just wanted to shake him and wake him up and say, war is real. Does that make sense? Because I had seen it. It does. But from my own experience of people trying to, not necessarily my parents, but other people talking to me about my desire to join the military, it may not have mattered what you would have said. Mm -hmm. Kieran might have heard you, but he might not have listened. And there's nothing that you can do about that. Right. And he was already, he'd already enlisted, so all the time I was worried about, well, what if uh, he quits, he goes AWOL, he is, would he be court-martialed, you know, all these things, would he be, I didn't know the pro- the procedure for dismissal or anything like either. that, or what, do they just do it on a case-by-case basis, do they, you know, so I had no idea, but that, that was really a concerning phone call that came late at night, and my husband and I tried to just say, it's going to be okay. Just relax. Go talk to the chaplain. We said, go talk to the chaplain. So he agreed to do that. But then the next night or two afterwards, he called back and said, I'm not going to do that because um, the chaplains do not keep things confidential. That's what my buddies told me. And they'll, there'll be something on my record or I don't want the chaplain to tell. I don't trust, you know, that lack of trust, but... I've since found out they they are bound to confidentiality. They are. Sometimes your buddies are idiots. And they give you information that's not necessarily correct. It's called rumint, rumor intelligence. And somebody heard somewhere, fifth party removed, about a story of a guy saying, well, I got screwed because of what I told the chaplain. And the reality is, is you got screwed because you did something stupid and you got caught for it. And it's a more convenient narrative to say that the chaplain turned you in. I don't have a lot of experience with chaplains. But I do have experience with psychologists and psychiatrists who work for and with the military on active duty at operational Mm -hmm. elements. And I would go and talk to them and they don't say anything unless you go. I'm sure they have the same criteria. If you're expressing um, an intent or desire to hurt yourself or others, I I think they're obligated to say something. But other than that, it is my understanding they're bound by the same confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Client, patient, it wouldn't be obviously be for the clergy, but... Uh, I don't know what that would be covered by. Same thing. I can't think of the words right now. But in my experience, they are everything that you would want them to be. Yes. And we found that out when we had started interacting with a chaplain. But he he didn't talk to the chaplain. And that was it. He He never called us again expressing any doubts or any misgivings or anything like that Mm -hmm. and uh, he was supposed to deploy to Afghanistan as soon as he finished AIT and he was not I think if he had everything could have been different if he had what if he had deployed immediately if he had deployed from almost virtually oh so they delayed him Fort Sam Houston he had deployed so he went he was supposed to go boot camp AIT deployment yeah but he went boot camp AIT and then there was a pause and that's the thing, yeah. rotation cycles, sometimes they get extended. Talk about what we're going through right now. COVID, from my understanding on the guys who are still in, detonated the deployment cycle. Oh, yeah. Because they didn't want to rotate people overseas and have people coming back. And they don't, you know, so that's, right. that's how that stuff happens. Or something else in the world will kick off. Syria will fire off. And instead mm-hmm. of Afghanistan, you know, now we're going to go west and we're going to stage out of Iraq again and go conduct operations in Syria. So things mm-hmm. shift. And those, those hiccups are natural. Hard to explain that they should be expected to somebody who's Mm -hmm. got, when he was in AIT, what are we talking, five months in the military? Yeah. That's a very little Mm -hmm. amount of time in the military. It's very very hard to understand how the bigger cogs in the wheel fit together. Very. And he was kind of impulsive by nature, so he could have jumped to different conclusions, but they told him, You're going to Fort Bragg. And uh, so he went there and his family. His wife and daughter went there from Middle Tennessee. They traveled up to Fort Bragg and because he knew he was going to be there long enough for her to leave her parents and mm-hmm. them to join join them up there. So it was going to be some months that he was going to be at Fort Bragg. What was he going to be doing there? Well, they had a um, like a machine, a place where you take care of equipment or heavy trucks, hmm. and they were like mechanics. But they, I hope I'm not explaining this wrong, but they had been trained to be medics. So they were constantly like upping their training or refreshing their training. But then they were doing work 
that was not always medic oriented, like doing maintenance on vehicles. That's all yeah. I can explain. Maintenance on vehicles, but they would go out like when people were jumping, mm-hmm. doing parachute jumping. Medical support. They would stand by in case somebody hurt their ankle or something like that. They would do that. But I think sometimes it was frustrating to have done that training and not really be able to use it. Mm-hmm. And there were probably several more delays where he'd been told you're going, then you're not going. Then there was the Haiti. Was that earthquake? Yep. Um, he was almost deployed for that and didn't. And again, I think if he could have been sent somewhere, it was that process of waiting that I think became very difficult. Okay. So you think if he was able to actually go execute his duties, it would have maybe rounded the edges on how he was feeling? Yes. It could have just changed the dynamic of the whole, the way things were, were kind of going. And, uh, but that, but that didn't happen. And again, my husband and I were in Memphis and he was in Fayetteville. It's about a thousand miles between the two. So we just didn't have a lot of feedback as to what was going on. But soon after they got settled up there, uh, about three months after he'd finished AIT, say around February or so, and I write about this in the book, I take my husband's old car to them so they'll have a vehicle because they had my old minivan. I was the minivan, minivan mom. Oh, I got some miles on a Honda Odyssey. It's an yeah. amazing urban assault vehicle. Hit what push button door open? <laughs> rockets on the top. That sounds Again, great. That's how yeah. I think. You're looking at me like I'm yeah. a psychopath. That's okay. That's what I see <laughs> when I see a minivan. I'm like, let's get six dudes in here and some rockets. <laughs> Flip down the DVD on the way to Target. Beep. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one I gave him just broke down completely. So yeah. we gave we gave him a vehicle, and I took it up there, and so I was able to see sort of where they were living. They were living on base, and you know, kind of get a, a little mm-hmm. bit of a feel for it. And I, I, it was the only time, other than going to Fort Knox, that I'd really ever been on U.S. bases. So I really thought I knew something about war, you know, like you say, but I hadn't really interacted with U.S. Uh, personnel yeah. except in Lebanon and you know that was that was an unusual as we've talked about that was a very unusual situation that was supposed to be peacekeeping and so sometimes I was comfortable with military stuff and other times not so comfortable feeling it was kind of a foreign land but um, so that that was February and uh, then he how he did he c- seem when you went up there with the vehicle Oh boy, that's a tough question. Yeah, just uh, he seemed okay. He seemed proud of what he was doing, and he seemed happy. He seemed he was I don't know taking a lot of responsibility, feeling the weight of the responsibility. You know, I have to take care of my wife and my daughter, and just feeling that was I think heavy for him but he didn't say that he didn't really say that at the time he had a lot on his shoulders for a man in his early 20s yeah he was really young I think he I think he turned 21 um no he would have been 22 turned 22 at AIT so it was it was a lot. I mean, I can't can't even imagine yeah. that and having that much responsibility. But I, I still we still felt he was doing well. He was still kind of he was kind of the the clown, you know, the unit. He was the one who provided some comic relief sometimes at his own expense, but sometimes uh, I know not. the guy you're describing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I think that he was very, very good as a medic. From what I understand, he was the one who everybody called and said, hey, can you help me with this or that? And they had to learn different types of bandages or wraps, Mm -hmm. ways of wrapping. And uh, he got good at IVs and helped others who didn't have the confidence with that skill. So... Of course I was proud. I really I really was proud. How could we how could we intervene and I say in the book if what if I had called 1-800 army? What if I had uh 
tried to get him i wanted to believe i had power and of course mm-hmm. i didn't have any any power at all but what if i'd gotten him removed and what if he'd gone back to middle tennessee and was living with his wife and her parents the daughter back at walmart or back at sam's club would he feel how would he feel then and how would he feel how would he felt about me or how would he felt about himself where here he had a chance to the army was helping him to succeed they were actually just going to make him succeed almost in spite of himself he was like one of these kids or young men young people who he feared success more than he feared failure really Hmm. i think so because if you experience success you're likely to be have more required of you and asked of you more in the spotlight more pressure and a young woman who was in the army with him as a medic told me that she said the that he was so competent the more competent you are the more they're going to put on you or they're going to the military rewards competence for sure and they will layer responsibilities on top of competence so it would be that the situation then would involve him going to afghanistan where somebody else wouldn't have to go because they weren't as good at as good at the job as he was but basically he came home after after i went up there in february of 2010 in February, in the whole of 2010 just was like this nightmare year. It was like the COVID thing now. It was like, just when is this nightmare going to end? Because I went, um, just personally, I had a bad skiing accident in, in March, tore, tore my ACL. Then my younger son, Matt, got one of his front teeth knocked out playing baseball. And that was about six weeks later. It just felt like things were just building to some bad thing (laughs) bad bad thing going on and then karen came home in june and to visit us because he said he wanted to visit us one time before he deployed because he was still waiting to deploy and it was like going to be maybe in the fall september october then eventually got moved to december of 2010 so he came home and visited for about 10 days but he was always with his friends and he was never with us and never at home and I was so That's disappointed. not about you guys, though. I know. And how do yeah, I know this? True. Because I, I did yeah. leave periods where I went home. Uh, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to come hang out. And by that, I mean, make sure dinner's ready because I'm going to eat it on the way out the door. And I might park your car in the grass because I'm going to be hammered on my way back home. <laughs> That's a young man who's 22 who the center of their universe is themselves. So that's mm-hmm. not on you guys. I think that's very common. Right. So, yes, I set myself up for, for disappointment. You didn't set yourself up for disappointment. And you just had a 22-year-old son. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only issue you had. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you're the mom. You have that fantasy of they're going to sit down with you and you're going to have talks and you're going to do I don't think sons realize. Like you used I d- to do I don't them. think sons realize the damage you can do at that level to mothers. Right. It's a weird age. I remember yeah. being in my early 20s as a young team guy, and all I wanted to do was – be my my friends, talking about work, or talking about my friends, or being at work, or you could just w- rinse, wash, and repeat that. You like I said, I I put my parents through hell, and I didn't mean to. I think that's totally normal. Yeah, it's like Matt, our younger son. Now he's <laughs> almost twenty six, and he's kind of surpassed that age yeah. that that Kieran was then and I still have those fan- fantasies that when he comes home in October he's on a ship now in the Gulf of Mexico moving all around that he's going to you know play yeah. we're going to play video games together board games I mean and you know just have those family nights and I know that's that's not even that's not normal it's more like the behavior you're talking about just, it doesn't make it, it they yeah. don't have any malicious intent but it doesn't make yeah. it any any easier to be on the receiving end of that right i get that now when my my kids are like no dad i can't hang out with you this weekend because i want to go do whatever i'm just like you mm-hmm. all i can see mm-hmm. is you know the infant that i used to hold and care yeah. for and yeah i get it it sucks that's it why does. i said for people who have kids and they're not teenagers yet hmm, just wait just wait <laughs> right yeah so I think I was a little bit upset with him, so I didn't reach out to him so much after he left, and that was 
like July, August. I think he called me on my birthday in July. And then um, after that, he communicated some with my husband, Tim. He was always good at keeping the lines of communication open. And uh, sometimes I think he didn't want to talk to me because maybe he knew what maybe he was planning, what he what he was going to do, and he didn't want to talk to me under or, those circumstances. Or he might have realized that he had hurt you intentionally or unintentionally the last time that you guys were together, and avoidance is easier than facing that and bridging that gap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wasn't doing my part. Like I said, I wasn't overly reaching out. I sent maybe at least one card and a note. And um, I know that he changed his Facebook profile picture to something. I wasn't friends with him on Facebook. It was kind of early days for me mm. with Facebook for, for a lot of us. But he was he was very active on social media, even prior to Facebook as a teenager when those other platforms and things first came out oh yeah he grew up you with know that, that stuff. he grew up with yeah. that stuff in the very very early stages then facebook uh appeared on the scene and he put up a profile picture that was disturbing i guess but i wouldn't have seen it because like i say it? it was um i say in the book hindu the hindu goddess of death hmm i am not familiar with that i think it's like a multi-armed woman who's sets of arms coming out in a, like a seated position okay in sort of a red and orange and yellow uh colors and at that same time he he defriended certain people but i i had no knowledge of this of course mm -hmm. but his wife told me later that he defriended certain people because he did not want them seeing his latest pictures of his latest tattoos what was he getting and he was all of his tattoos i just assumed he got them because he wanted to not spend much money he wanted to spend the least <laughs> i mean i mean i don't know anything about tattoos <laughs> okay are you trying so to you say can correct that, me i don't are you know trying anything to say they're not good um uh, to me not not <laughs> not tastefully done what were more they? like Oh, uh, he had like a write in the book. He, what I saw was he had a, like a checkerboard thing on his chest, just like I mean, a, a not checkerboard, like a tic tac toe, just lines going horizontal and vertically. More than just the tic tac toe board, like repeating tic tac toe boards, or just one? Just, just one. Interesting. Just one and and uh, um, to me, I just describe him in the book as being garish in the sense like not a lot of colors. They were always just black. And just heavy. That's kind heavily. of a style, though. Yeah, maybe it's a style thing. Yeah. Not a Some people prefer... Expense. Well, no, I know uh, people who have full sleeves with no color whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know people who have got a freaking pastel painting on their arm. Kind of just yeah. the individual, whatever suits them. Yeah, yeah. So, so he seemed to like tattoos, and that had been a thing... Uh, as a teenager, you know, we said we're we're not paying for any tattoos, and uh, so when he got out on his own, it was just important to him to have tattoos. Maybe I read too much into it. I felt like he was uh, defacing his body, or that that it was a sign of um, not self mutilation, but almost like I just I didn't like it, but. You know, I understand that that's what the young people do. Did he get most of them when he was in the Army? Yeah, probably. It's a little, I mean, in the SEAL community, I can say tattoos are kind mm -hmm. of part of the culture as well, too. So that might sure. have had a little bit of uh, an aspect to it. Mm hmm So in August, um, August 28th, 2010, he, uh, he took his life. And that's um and that was it so it's very heavy and i'm sorry that you had to or have to continue to live through this yes i think someone said to me recently um 
and he's a public figure to a certain extent, and he has uh, had attempts that he talks about or has talked about openly. He said that reading the book made him realize what he would be doing to other people, to his loved ones. That had not been necessarily my intent. I didn't say I'm going to prove, I'm going to show people, all people who might be contemplating suicide that how much it hurts others I just didn't you know consciously think that but he said that's that that would have stopped him or now he he realizes how much it would hurt other people I don't think he would attempt again anyway I think he's past that Mm -hmm. you know past that point in his life and it's very important to get past that point like you say when you're 20 21 22 you don't know yourself you're just you're almost he he was like a child and they say some males are are slower to mature maybe with their brains proven time and time again by every single male on the face of the planet (laughs) they're evidence of that but um did your son talk to anybody um before he took his life did he give anybody indication that that is what he was planning on doing not to my knowledge because I assume now you guys have probably talked to friends of his or his wife, or it. And I ask that because of the people that I know, I haven't, I haven't been able to put together a pattern or a breadcrumb. Exactly. Because the people that I do know who have said that, it's an immediate all hands on deck rush to try to do everything that you possibly can do. Which I think may be why some people don't say anything because they want the op. They don't want that to happen. Right, um, because they know it might change their mind, or or they don't want people to know about that. But yeah, so far I haven't uh, I haven't encountered anybody who did take their life, who truly left much of an indication that they were going to do so. Right. right. Did he ever, growing up, um, with the struggles that he was having in school, did he ever have suicidal ideations that he talked to you guys about? Did it ever come up? I think he did, and, and in the book I say that he had uh, a couple of experiences that were attempts or like attempts, but we were never sure that they really were. Yeah, maybe a call for and, help or something like that? Yeah. By beha- Are yeah. you talking about by behavior? Yes. But after he died, I eventually found a poem that where he writes, as a teenager he writes, about wanting to take his life at a very young age, which is very unusual. About eight years old, he wanted to take his life. But I never saw that poem till after his death. I took it to a therapist, and she said what I already knew, which was that, that for an eight-year-old, it's very unusual. It's very out of the ordinary. Yeah. So, but I, I agree with you that there, you see a lot of times there are no signs and, but the experts say that there are signs, but you have to be, I don't know, very attuned to to those signs to know yeah. that somebody is seriously uh, planning to make an attempt. And we were geographically a long way away from him, even though he had been home recently. And, you know, in that time... I didn't see anything. I don't think his wife saw anything. And I just think he would have, he wasn't going to do a cry for help thing. He wasn't going to do a failed attempt. He was going to make sure to do it. And it looked like it had been planned. But then at the same time, it also looked like it could have been impulsive. Yeah. Which I write about in the book. He just um, goes out goes to a friend's and he could have and he normally did that on a Friday on a Friday night he went to a friend's off the base and that could have happened that could have just been a a normal night he went with another soldier who drove because he didn't want to be driving Mm -hmm. drinking and driving he's very careful about that anyway so it could look like he planned it uh, but it could also look like it was just a just a typical friday night for him but and he and he did leave leave a note which i don't print in the book the whole thing 
but I reference it. I sort of reference the contents briefly. And apparently only about 15% of people leave a note, and he put his on Facebook. So in that sense, it wasn't private. And, uh, you know, he denied that it had anything to do with deployment. And he repeated how much he loved his wife and daughter, didn't blame anyone. That was basically the gist of it, a paragraph. But with no explanation other than that? No explanation except, I believe, referencing, again, like back to that, to that poem, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but not saying how long. It's so hard to see inside of somebody like that. Um, you just, yeah, like I said, the the last guy that I know that took his life, he would be what most people in the SEAL community would aspire to be like. And from an outside perspective, if you looked at him in his uniform, you know, spit and polish, the shining example of what a SEAL would be. And there's nothing left but questions. And mm-hmm. I, I just... I can only imagine how devastating that was. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was just, it was unbelievable. And that's where kind of like, I'm sure you've been in those situations, time slows down and you really literally feel like you're moving in slow motion. And that's the part of the book where I just kind of go through it literally almost moment by moment, which is kind of kind of agonizing you know and I didn't I didn't mean to write it that way necessarily but it just was me processing and kind of just going through working your way through the moments literally moment by moment and yeah but I didn't want to write something that was going to be too agonizing you know this like I wasn't wanting to upset people all I was I, I hope the book is I don't believe it is upsetting people have told me that when they reach the end they find it uplifting in a way Uh, but that was just the way I had to write it was just this happened this happened this happened and then it speeds then it speeds back up and I tried to write it just in the scenes just I don't go into long lectures about suicide or Mm -hmm. suicide prevention or Uh, facts about suicide of which there are many of how many die and they're readily available yes there are a lot of myths about suicide all that I never I never step out of the narrative the narrative is always a scene in a present day sense and then with flashbacks flashbacks to earlier times Um, because I wanted to keep the reader I, I just wanted to engage the reader I wanted people to read because they have suffered a loss or have suffered no loss or they've all they've all probably suffered some kind of loss if they've lived to a certain age it's for memoirs for the community of loss anyone who's experienced loss it, do, it doesn't have to be military mm-hmm. so i didn't want it to be oh well this is only for mothers who've lost children t- who were active duty s- service members otherwise nobody's going to run to read this book it's just not going to be of interest so it was challenging because i had to suspend a lot of things about journalism because i had to recreate dialogue and you don't do that in journalism You know, you take very careful notes Mm -hmm. or transcribe, record, check, backstop everything. So I had to be somewhat creative. I had to recreate dialogue. But it didn't, you know, actually start that way. It just started as a, I'll just write some of this stuff down, you know, just to just to process. But that's everything about it was deeply deeply traumatic because we were the main thing was we were not notified in the standard army way and my husband had always said i mean we'd been on this road for 18 months or so with kieran he'd been Mm -hmm. in enlisted for about 18 months he he wouldn't really share with me but did later that i just feared those guys walking up to the door it's just you know that image you almost think it's like a movie or something 
but they always come in person. They're supposed to always, and I've talked to so many people in the Army about this Mm -hmm. since, they never, never, never want a survivor to be notified, told over the phone, no matter what. It doesn't matter where they are in the world. And you were notified by your daughter-in-law, correct? Correct. Yes, so it would be primary next of kin notification, and given that situation, it would be primary to his wife. And they probably, it was at nighttime, correct? Or was no, it, daytime it was daytime. Notified? So they probably would have had to, uh, they're called CACO officers, casualty assistance call officers. They would have had to find their way to you, which yes. requires time. But they will mm-hmm. not delay telling the primary next of kin, which was his wife. Did they, did they try to send somebody in person or they never did? They did. They did. But I suppose they should have told her, don't don't tell over the phone. I mean, I'm, you know, would you I'm, be able to hold on so to that confusing. information? No, I wouldn't either. Right. They may have told her that she may not even remember them yeah. telling her that. Right. And right. it's it's a matter of geography at that point of the speed of a telephone call on a cell phone versus a, mm-hmm. a Keiko team making it to your residence for notification. Right. And I don't know. She might have just been so much in shock that she didn't know that she was calling. They didn't say don't call. They didn't yeah. say uh, someone was someone was with her. My understanding um, is in those moments they may they may not have said anything to her because it is my understanding in those moments that they try to keep it pretty precise and mm-hmm. not overload and overwhelm. You're not talking about preference and burial you know the, like those conversations are for later the benefits mm-hmm. that come from that they're all they're all from later but that's that's a rough way to find out for sure i've been notified of many a friend dying either over text message mm-hmm. or phone call and it's I've literally had people say hey mm-hmm. man are you sitting down and it's like, just mm-hmm. tell me who it is i mean that's a <laughs> it's a shitty way to find out for sure but it is, I mean, with the, in the age, yeah, the age of cell phones and stuff like that, we are going to find out Correct. things. We can find out things out more quickly. Again, I know someone was with her from the Army, but I don't know if they said, don't call or it's okay to call or what, just let her do whatever she wanted to do. I don't even know if she knew what she was doing. She might have been so much in shock. So she called me, and um, I was at home pretty much I was by myself except for Matt was upstairs I had just picked him up from football practice my younger son and uh, so I knew he was in the house but I felt alone and I was terrified that I just wasn't going to make it yeah I just didn't think I, I mean you've been through this experience so you know can I make it can I survive the next the next breath so I did have to make that same decision. I had to decide to tell my husband mm-hmm. over the phone because he was at work and he was in a simulator and you don't, he doesn't have his phone on in the simulator. So I thought, what do I say? Do I, I couldn't even think. My brain was going crazy. Just do I tell him, come home. There's been, just come home. There's an emergency. And then he would worry more. Yeah. And he have a half hour drive home wondering what in the world is going on. Or do I just tell him? And so it's kind of, I guess, maybe more surgical just to go ahead and say it. I find in my experience, you have to be very precise with your language. Um, saying things, and I think you said this in your book, you know, he's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing wrong with that by any stretch of the imagination. But I've, I've had people say, what do you mean? And if it gets to the point where I have to notify people, I'm like, listen, this is what happened. Fill in the blank name. He's dead. Just Mm -hmm. so there's no question in the mind. But it's not. Those are the worst phone calls ever, ever. The only thing worse than that, face-to-face notification. You think that's worse? It's harder because it's the emotions are thrown right into your face. And you can watch somebody (sighs) melt Mm -hmm. from the inside out. Yeah, I was very afraid of the uh, soldiers coming to the door. The Keiko officers, yeah. And I wanted to leave, and and so we did. We just, I don't think my husband wanted to see them either. Nobody does. I think that's the worst nightmare of any parents. 
is to see two people walking up to your house or a person walking up to your house in dress uniform. Mm -hmm. So we just, it was just, my, my body felt on fire. I just felt like my body was burning up or I was just, could, I wanted to crawl out of my skin, you know, just to get away, to get away from the pain, somehow get away from it. And it's, it helps to have something to do. So we just started planning to fly up to Fort Bragg as soon as we could. And if she hadn't told us, his wife, we probably wouldn't have gotten up there that day. But we had enough time to get a flight to Raleigh and then drive from there. Otherwise, we might not have made it out till the next day. And we were just like, we want to help. We want to help. We want to help. We wanted to, yeah. we wanted to support her, you know, as much as we could. And uh, so, it was just, it was really grueling to have to have to fly, have to get on an airplane, and it's under those circumstances. Yeah, I'm sure you've experienced that too. And I know I'm not the first person. I'm not the first mother uh, who this has happened to. Which kind of ended up causing inner conflict in me about writing the book because I was like, well, my story, how is my story different? Because why, it's yours. But why should I write mine and why shouldn't all the other people write theirs? They should. Yeah, I think they should. I think they should. I think every story has validity and uh, that's what... You know, you ask yourself as a reporter when you go out, you say, is there a story in this? Is there a story? Yes, you you will fashion the material, not manipulate it, but you will shape it into a story that makes sense when people read it. And that's all there is to it. It's not a hard thing, but it's not an easy thing to do either. But I just, I just felt like documenting. And so we went up there and by the... By the time we got up to Fort Bragg, it was late. Our, our uh, daughter-in-law's sister was with her and had come up. So we, didn't, we went to a hotel, and then we saw her the next day. But we just drove to the base. We had no idea. We had no idea where anything was. I'd been there that one time before. We were just, you know, I guess in shock, and just the base was... The base was so big and so yeah, foreign. Fort Bragg is massive. It's so massive. And, you know, we just had no idea what to do. But really the upshot of that part of the book is that we were never assigned a casualty assistance officer, but we should have had our own. And that would have made a big difference. And um, at least to me, we had no advocate. But in recent years, as I understand it, they – they assign CAOs to the parents, and they're separate from the CAO for the spouse, the casualty assistance officer. So you each have your own because sometimes people don't get along or they're not, in our case, not close, yeah, not really. Yeah, family situations yeah, can be very complex. Very, very complex. So I think the Army recognized the parents need one, and yeah. so we never got one. That's unfortunate, yeah. and that's going to make it more difficult. How would you say absent? that that the military handled it kind of up and down you know good things bad things i think that we and our daughter-in-law we were not real happy with the cao but that person in particular particular you know you're the army's appointing someone from a vast pool mm -hmm. of people they get um Everybody above a certain rank has to be trained as a CAO for their convenience because they want to be able just to send them out and have plenty have plenty of them. Mm -hmm. And some people are not well suited to being CAOs. Agreed. It's not it's not a good fit for yeah. them. And so we we didn't know anything. Again, my husband had been in the Navy, but I had this assumption that a CAO is is a full time job. That's what you do. Tertiary duty at best. Not. That's it. So some are going to do a better job than, than others, and some are temperamentally not suited. And I've heard that if you feel you're not suited to that job and, and you're asked to do it and you're having problems at home or you have other things going on, be honest and tell whoever at the CAC, whoever's in charge yeah. at the Casualty Assistance uh, Center, that you don't feel like you can do it and i think that's better a better choice but this person just didn't feel 
They weren't knowledgeable. They weren't comfortable in what they were doing. A lot of people, I think, are not comfortable in with issues surrounding death, and then they're not comfortable with issues surrounding suicide. You layer layer that on yeah. top. So we didn't have any guidance, and she didn't have a great didn't have great guidance. We just had she ever done it before. Um, the CAO never. No, it was it was a gentleman, and he a uh, sergeant, I think was his rank and he had not that was one of the things he told us that yeah and that caused us to lose confidence in him right away and when the family's lost confidence in you or their confidence is shaken then it's tough it's just tough really it's tough later on top of tough later on top of tough uh, like you said yeah so we felt we had my husband and I that we had to do a lot we had to we had to contact the CAC about certain things. I had to learn all that lingo, like the CAC. I was the JAG. I was the, you know, talking in those acronyms that I don't know and I don't understand just to try to mm -hmm. speak the language Military. with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the worst thing was I wanted to see my son. And I kept saying that to people, but it felt like we were hitting this wall. Did they not want to allow you to see him? I didn't even know. I don't think so. I didn't even know how to go about doing that. I didn't. I was so scared to say anything in front of my daughter-in-law. I just didn't want to upset her that we couldn't convey the information that the desire to see him to the CAO because he was always with her and yeah. we, we couldn't speak privately. Did, did she him. ever end up seeing him or did she not want to your daughter-in-law? She did not. No, but it was never even discussed. Her CAO never even brought it up. In my own personal experience, it may be better that you didn't. And I say that because I wish I hadn't have seen some of my friends for the last time. I wish I would have remembered them for who they were because the image that I struggle with is what I saw them as and what they looked like versus who they were to me and the friendship and the amazing memories. And it has scrambled my eggs since the day that it has happened mm -hmm. or that multiple times that it has happened. You might have, you might be better off remember your, remembering your son just for the last memory that you have in your head. It's very hard to get around some of those last uh, sights. I agree. And the commander of the hospital eventually wrote me and said that, what you're saying, that it was probably not not yeah. the best, not the best venue, not the best time and place. It might not have helped you in your process of healing and moving through and hopefully eventually past it. It might have been an anchor that tugged you back. It right. has been for me in my life and some of my experiences. I'm really sorry that. That you had to go through those experiences. It uh, it's part of makes me who I am, you know, and why I view the world the way that I do, and why I try to behave the way that I do. I mean, I'm a product of the environment that's around me. But in those particular situations, I would generally advise people against it because the negative outweighs the benefit, it, or it has in my life. And and all that time, I felt like I was failing him, that I was not honoring him. But I was doing, you know, you're just moving in that time and space, doing what you think is the best thing to do at that moment. And yeah. there's survivor's guilt for I didn't go and see him in that situation. I didn't know that he was at the base hospital because this happened off base. Yeah, I just didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know where he was. And it, it just felt like. I would have had to just storm the hospital doors and gone in and just demanded to see him. And I say in the book that, well, some mothers would have done that. And, and I've, I've heard of that. And I've heard of wives doing that, saying, I want to see him, even if there's I only like and this I've, much left, I've, fingernail. I've seen it happen. And it's not always the it's result that good. they're looking for. Yeah. Not good. And no, death is an ugly thing. 
especially when we're uh, talking mm -hmm. about that type of death, a ballistic, re ballistically related death. It's they're not this, they're not the same person after that. They don't look the same. Mm -mm. It's I, if you can ever, hopefully you'd be able to put down the guilt about not seeing your son. I suspect he probably would not have wanted you to. I think that's right. And that whole time I was just, like I say, moving through time and space going, is what I'm doing right, wrong? Should I be doing this? Should I be, should I be demanding? Should I be, I was, you know, I was doing things that just felt like required superhuman strength just to pick up the phone and call mortuary affairs and say, okay, is, is my son's body going to the funeral home now? And then when it goes to the funeral home, it's going to be transported by air to Nashville. Then just all of those, my husband and I felt we had to know every step because we didn't have confidence in the CAO. So we yeah. were there backstopping and backstopping and backstopping everything along the way. And, um, you know, we had, we did have the chaplain with us a lot and he was, he was very good support. And we had hoped that he would come down to Nashville and do the funeral there, be a part of the funeral there, but he, he couldn't be released from the unit because, or whoever he served, I think it was obviously more than just my son's unit. But with the unit, they were concerned, very concerned about contagion contagion factor which the, were others going to be influenced mm -hmm. by my son's death and I just couldn't help but feel so responsible and so I know he was grown he was he was responsible for his own actions but I was still like he's my child and he did this and now other people are suffering and other people are experiencing very bad reactions even to the point of being hospitalized others. And I felt so, the guilt was just incredible. I can only imagine, but absolutely none of it was your fault. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it, and I, it's probably hard to hear and hard to accept, but that is the reality of it. And I can only say that because I wasn't directly involved. And I've seen enough of these situations that are similar or identical, um, I think everybody has survival's guilt. I do, for sure. Um, but it's, I, I don't know what else you mm -hmm. could have possibly done. I just didn't think about the contagion factor of things and, you know, that that that, that, was, that, that was a possibility and it was just a really hard week, as you can imagine. The mm -hmm. week, the week that we spent, we spent a week up at Fort Bragg, just getting everything settled and having the unit memorial. They moved up the unit memorial. Normally, it would have been possibly as long as two months. Yeah, it takes some time after, to put that stuff together. But they, they just kind of slammed it all together because, which was okay. You know, I was just going to go with the flow of that. If that was going to happen, then we wouldn't have to go back. We wouldn't have to go back to Fort Bragg. And our daughter-in-law wouldn't have to go back. So we packed up everything. But it just still felt like, it felt like the Army was just avoiding us. You know, it felt like that, that everybody was just avoiding us. And uh, You're not the only people that I've ever spoken to that have said that. The military is incredibly good at some things. And like I said earlier, not great at others and that's what I didn't want to the book to be well this is just a slamming the army and slamming you know the way they do everything and they were so inept or they were so insensitive or this didn't go right and that didn't go right it it's a stressful time you know I had already buried both my parents I know Funerals don't always go like you want them to. Yep. People get hurt feelings. Things don't happen just like you want. And you're just trying to be sensitive and go with, go with, really just go with the flow with it, a flow of it because it was so much out of our hands and so much in the control of the army. But, you know, all we saw all week were 
the CAO and the chaplain, and we saw and met his his unit members at the unit memorial. And it was just a lot to pack in in a week, and then we had two more services after that. We had a funeral, regular funeral, and uh, he's buried in a in West Tennessee Veterans Cemetery in, I'm sorry, Middle Tennessee, Middle Tennessee State Veterans. And uh, I think that was the right decision. That's where we live now. And his uh, his daughter lives and his wife live close so they can visit. How old is she now? Now his daughter is 12. So it's just, you know, life goes on. It can go on a long time, you know. And he didn't get to see all the changes that would have occurred in himself, in his marriage, maybe in his daughter's life. In she the world. was, yeah, the world. Sometimes, well, with the coronavirus, I say, I'm glad my parents aren't alive for it. <laughs> Not, you know, just it's, I really do say that, and that's kind of bad, I guess, to say, but um, his daughter was two at the time, and I think two is a very, very challenging age to very, um, she she was a challenging child at that age and so he he couldn't see that was just a moment in time she was not going to be two forever he couldn't see that he'd just gotten the worst news or bad news for him maybe the worst news ever that he was going to go as one of five medics to support the marines in hellman province where as i understand it there were actual buildings and it wasn't just tents or anything at that stage was actual buildings and it wasn't so terrible but I think he was just so feeling the weight of that responsibility I'm responsible for 60 60 other guys and their health and well-being and how I perform as a medic and he would have had that success that that's how I see it that he denied himself the success that was right there like you said that feeling of being deployed and that the comradeship and the bonding and the experience of the, the words that you've used like exhilaration or the purpose the purpose yeah, it's, yes it's yes. hard to describe actually but that's what we experienced too as journalists I, I've never had that sense of purpose again in my life that you know, I'm covering a war and I'm telling people about it and that sort of I thing. I haven't either. Um, I haven't either, and I think a lot of guys get stuck chasing it. And the problem is, I don't. It's just such a bizarre and unique occupation. I think it's impossible to do so. And again, mm-hmm. you have to get out of the comparative mindset. Mm-hmm. And maybe mm-hmm. in that instance, you're comparing yourself against your former self, which I think is a good thing because that's the only metric that matters. But maybe not in that exact, specific, one precise way. Did writing the book yeah. help you move on? Not move on. That's not the right word. Move through all of this to be able to hopefully help other people and move forward, I would say, with your life? I do. I think so. I think so. But there were so many times when I, I questioned it. I questioned it. Was this was – this the right thing to do was this it was an instinct or an impulse I had which I think is at the very basis is to make sense of the senseless to make suicide in particular is a senseless act so can you can you make how do you make sense of it a friend of mine texted me the other day like my best friend she said it you wrote that book because you it was a search for meaning you were searching for meaning and I think that's that's pretty much it that's fundamental and how do you find meaning or make sense of a seemingly senseless act are there what layers are there in that so it's really like then it turns into kind of an excavation project you know you're digging and trying to get to the bottom of something almost like a a sleuthing you know i mentioned liking the nancy drew mysteries you're trying to find out but you're knowing you never will i mean i think all suicide loss survivors 
have to come to terms with the fact that they will never have definitive answers. And that is a tough cookie to crack. Mm -hmm. You've probably experienced that with the people you're just, you've you're, lost. You're left with questions. Mm -hmm. You're left with a lot of questions and no answers. And even if they mm -hmm. do leave something behind, it's, it's not like that answers all the questions I have. It, it's, yeah. Right. There are just layers and layers of that. So that's what I did, and I just worked through it, but it was always, I had an ambivalence about it. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to sit down and write a book, and this is going to be great, and this is going to be cathartic, and this is going to help people. I think that would have, those are, those are motivations people ascribe to me, but they weren't necessarily my motivations just because it's not that I don't want to help people, but I wouldn't presume that something I would write would have the ability to do that, to achieve that. You might be surprised. You may be surprised the impact that it will have. I, I mean, what you're describing with the army and going through those situations and the notification and the slowing of time, there's not a lot of people who will, well, everybody at some point in their life will experience loss, but that particular situation, although it's not common, thankfully, the things that you thankfully. write about are, are helpful. And they're beneficial, and I think it'll touch more people than you might realize. Well, I hope it's not too too intense, and I didn't put this disclaimer in there. If I talked to my publisher about it, but we didn't. Just this, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and some people say you should always, always mention that if you're in a discussion about suicide, the 1-800-273-TALK or 273-8255 or text HOME. To two to seven four one seven four one. I mean, I could have had that written in the front of the book, but I'm I'm not too big on disclaimers because I'm like I want people to judge, make their own judgments, and I also have confidence in I people. Agree. I have confidence in the reader that if the reader finds something too intense, it's not for them. They can put it down. They can put it down. That they don't have to read it. It's not for Individual them. accountability and responsibility is a thing. It's okay to make your own decisions based off the information presented to you. I agree. I think people should be able to decide whether it's enough or not enough or too much. It's a hard call because at first, you know, you think, well, if I just put, if, if I just put that in the, in the uh, beginning of the book, that prejudice, it, it creates a prejudice, really, yeah. possibly against the story right away. When people have said to me, I'm glad I read it. I found it uplifting. Some uh, suicide loss survivors, even recent ones, have embraced it. They didn't have a military loss. And there have been other survivors who said, I'm not ready for that. Yeah. I'm, or they look at it like it's a snake. That's not, you know, that, that book is not for me. But I definitely didn't. I wrote the whole thing and did not include the disclaimer, even in up to the last minute I didn't. What I did include was in the back, something about the coronavirus <laughs> of all things because when I got the book when I got what they call the ARCs advanced reader copies in a box and it was about February and my husband Tim and I knew the virus was coming because he uh, had been traveling to China quite a bit and he was hearing more and more about it so we were a little bit ahead of people on that and I saw the cover and I said the world looks different now. It was very <laughs> ominous. Do you get it? I did like, just get it. And then <laughs> it's, uh, what would that be, a daisy? But then I'm like, oh my God, that looks like DNA strains. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I love it. Yes, DNA. Oh, that's that's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah, no, from it, the angle before you can yeah. tell it's a daisy. Or yes. that's, not a, that's not a daisy. What is that? What do you call those things? That is a dandelion. God, I am so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm you can not, blow in a daisy if you want to, people. Just don't expect the dandelion result. And I'm not good on botany at all, but I mean a dandelion. I don't know. Some people in my in my publishing world have said that that's a cliched image. You shouldn't have used that, you know, or they weren't crazy about it. But I became obsessed with it, even though it was a similar image was used on a book in 2017, not a book on this subject. It's your book, Margaret. You tell those people to shut up. I just went with it. Yeah, but these are these are called parachutes the yeah. little the little things that fly off you probably remember that yeah i was like okay i remember that i get it so in the book there there is a parachute jump i i go and do a tandem 
parachute jump. I like this story so far. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> this story has everything. This book has everything <laughs> that you are interested in, Andy. Um, mental health yep. issues, parachute jumps, got the whole thing. So um, I do that. It's kind of it's kind of a spoiler, I guess, but I have to say it um, because I know you've you've done a lot of that. So I get a chance to do that with the Army and with a group called Leap of Faith, which allows uh, survivors, not just a suicide, but any military uh, survivors of any loss, and maybe veterans too, you can sign up to do this thing. That's awesome. It was. It was awesome, but I was so scared. <laughs> Very common. Very common. It was like, so I describe that, I describe that whole experience, and that's, that's near the end. It's not the it's not how the book ends like, oh, it's this parachute jump and that's the end and they live happily ever after. But it was a uh, life changing moment, a cathartic moment. It was a a moment of exhilaration and that occurs uh, about almost exactly two years from after after Kieran's death. And it's through that and through other experiences with the army that the army emerges as the hero of the book. I did not plan that. <laughs> I did not write it that way. I, that's why I like to just let things evolve, not say oh, I'm going to sit down and yeah, I'm going to sit down and write something that's going to prove the army is yeah. good or the army is bad or it's just let it write it and let those scenes speak for themselves and that's what it said at the end because the army helped me the army helped me tons and i'm a civilian i didn't do anything i i talked to them i've explained and my husband has too what our grievances were and we we got an out brief with the colonel um he came from fort bragg and there was it was all just very kind respectful healing helped with the healing process and even before that I I started going to Fort Campbell which is about four hours from Memphis but now I can drive up there in less than an hour and I started talking to the CAOs because once I got uh, I got an email saying any survivor who wants to come talk to the CAOs in their training in the end as they wind up their training phase that's critical it was amazing it was amazing so they, they just tell you, the survivors, you know, this is the most important part of their training, and uh, it's, it's critical to their training that they see survivors, that, that we're real, we have a face, and we're really, uh, everything they've learned maybe has been from manuals, manuals and books, and now they hear the survivor stories, and they just, they just let you talk, which is kind of dangerous for some of us, but, you know, just like you're letting me talk, you just, you just tell your story the way you want to tell your story or however it comes out. You just kind of ramble it out. This happened, this happened, this happened. So I do try to shape it in a way so they get something out of it, the message that, hey, if you see parents and they don't have a casualty assistance officer, you you notify somebody tell the cac and yeah. take take very specific take very specific actions and uh so that that was the first thing i really started doing with the army uh thanks to fort campbell and then uh they told me at fort campbell the sos office i usually interact with them a lot they're very good there they tell me about about the leap of faith and so i did that and the title sort of plays off of that I didn't intend that but it does the world looks different now because I jumped out of a helicopter Chinook and just you know you're seeing you're seeing a different perspective you're lifted up you're looking around I mean I can't imagine all the things you've done incredible Uh, you're seeing literally somebody's pulled you up and you're seeing everything so it I needed that I needed to be pulled out of that and I I think it's important to do things and not just I was really in my head and that's what concerned me about the book I was always it was this thing of wrestling is this healthy or when is this crossing the line and this is mentally mentally this is not healthy I shouldn't be sitting in a room 
torturing words all day long and trying to capture uh, experiences in words. And, and so it took me a long time to write it for that reason. Like I would say about nine years, but I had two, two years off in the middle when we moved to Middle Tennessee to be closer to our granddaughter, which, you know, turned out to be a good thing. Um, but, but the parachute jump was, it was transformational. So that's just a hint nobody's going to get it <laughs> except you, you and you and me now that those are those are uh, what they call little parachutes but it just captures to me the delicacy of life and how delicate and how fragile it can be and also the feeling these little parachutes of flying through space yeah. and um, just also some people say it's like an, it looks like an explosion it could also look like something quite violent but I knew I didn't want something really literal on the yeah. cover like the actual parachute I researched all these different types of parachutes that is and a way better yeah something a step back yeah. not not to write up on top of the subject too much so all I can say is I am so incredibly sorry for your loss and that you had to experience that but what exceeds that feeling of sorrow is gratefulness that you were able to write that book um, like I said I haven't been able to finish it yet but I will get through it probably in the next day or two and I know for a fact that it will help people and you know some people respond better to reading about it some people respond better to watching a video on it or hearing about it but I think the true struggle is to never stop trying to talk about this stuff and hopefully make a difference in somebody's life who they can make a left turn with this decision instead of a right. Exactly. And yes. it sucks that you guys had to live through that, but I'm grateful that that book is the end result of it. I'm grateful for you guys for making the travel up here. And I'm going to let you close this out with whatever you want to. I'm going to have, first off, let's have a guess. How long do you think you and I have been chatting? I don't know. <laughs> Probably about three idea. hours. Oh, wow. <laughs> I can't believe that. Three and a half hours. Wow. The time's really flown. That's how you know you had a good conversation. What would you... What do you want mothers out there to know? Well, you can't tr control your child's life, and they're... What? Rewind well, that. Yes, okay. you can. Yes, you can. As a father, you can. Yeah. And what you will do well, is push they... them away. <laughs> I hijacked your message. It was going to be amazing. That's no. my own personal experience speaking through. <laughs> no, I agree. That's... The harder you try to control, I think okay. the farther they go away. It's... Yeah. Uh, what's that space sand stuff that when you squeeze mm -hmm. it, it starts coming out in between your fingers? hard to describe that when you try to do that with your kids that's what's going to happen yeah yeah i think you you do you have to let them go as painful as that is you've got to let them go and live their own live their own lives and be the be the people that they are i agree as hard as that may be they'll make decisions that you won't agree with or that you won't appreciate but those are those those are their decisions to make yes I agree with that thank you for coming up here I appreciate it thank you so much for having me I really Anytime. appreciate it if you read another really book it. you're coming back up <laughs> alright Margaret thank you thank you thank you again to Duke Cannon for supporting the Cleared Hot Podcast whether you choose the Bud Box or the Beer and Bourbon Box or you could go with my favorite, which would be both. Duke Cannon's October Fresh is the best way to bring your love of beer into the shower. Visit DukeCannon.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT10, all one word, all uppercase, for 10% off your next order. Free shipping with orders over 20 bucks. I said it at the beginning, and I'll end the episode with this. They're one of my favorite brands. They make awesome stuff. I was using them for a long time before they reached out for a sponsorship. And hopefully my kids aren't listening to this. I have two teenage boys. Their stocking is going to be stuffed with just about everything on this website. Because, spoiler alert, teenage boys don't smell great. Shocker, I know. And before I ramble on for another 20 minutes, that is it. 
See y'all on Monday.